Okay, welcome back everyone. I move that we reconvene this May 21st, 2021 meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Commissioner Toya seconds, Commissioner. Yes. yes. Commissioner Sanchez. Yes. Commissioner Esposito. Yes. Commissioner Toya. Yes. Great, I vote yes, we are back. Um, let's move right along to calendar number 214-21-Z. And this is at 2655 West Haddon Avenue. I believe that we have uh, Sarah Barnes and or Nick Fatikas on this one. I'm trying to get in. Um. Oh, sure. I think we've got you now, Counselor. Oh, okay. We're good. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Thank you so much. Um, I believe my witness, can I just confirm that my witnesses are here before I begin, Mr. Chairman? Yep, absolutely. Okay, Um, we should have a Josh Kruger. Yes, I'm here. Okay, Um, as well, we should have Andrew Wang, our project architect. Yes, I'm here. Awesome, great. Um, towards that end, Mr. Chairman, would you like to swear in my witnesses before I proceed with any initial? Yeah, sure thing. So, so yeah, Mr. Kruger, can you please state your name and address? Uh, Joshua Krieger, 111 East Chestnut Street, apartment 51H, uh, Chicago. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? I do. Thank you very much. Um, and Mr. Wang, uh, will you state your name and address? Yes, Andrew Wang, uh, 5639 North Palman Avenue, Chicago, Illinois, 60659. Thank you, and do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and uh, esteemed members of the board. For the record, my name is Sarah Barnes, and I'm an attorney with the Law Offices of Sam Banks, located at 221 North LaSalle Street. I'm happy to be here this afternoon on behalf of the applicant, Campbell Ventures LLC. As I briefly already introduced here with us today virtually um, is one of the managing members of the applicant, Josh Krieger, as well as our project architect, Andrew Wing. Um, far be it from me to ever bring you a really straightforward and normal case. So this is somewhat interesting from its inception more so due to the description of the case as opposed to actually um, from a practical standpoint. Um, we are here today because the applicant is in the final procedural steps towards proactively yet retroactively cleaning up kind of an erratic permit history for the subject property and improvements, um, which such improvements were actually established at the property over 100 years ago or almost 100 years ago um, over that time and through many different owners. Um, the permit records just seem to have some discrepancies. So we are attempting to, again, kind of clean up that permit history um, so that the property doesn't have any encumbrances and it can be properly insured and improved. So with that, um, even the functionality of the existing building and improvements is not going to change at all. It's going to continue to function um, both physically and again, from an occupancy standpoint, just as it has for well over 50 years. Um, so with that, even with the descriptive statement that was in the face of the application and um, without reading the findings of fact and without knowing more about it, it's a little confusing. Um, simply put, we're here today seeking a variation to eliminate the required on-site parking for the existing multi-unit building and coach house, um, which such improvements, again, were originally constructed just about 100 years ago. And um, you can see from the survey and probably the photographs that those structures actually occupy over 95% of the subject site. Um, so as a result, there has never been on-site parking or off-street parking accommodations 
for the existing multi-unit building or for the coach house. Um, and there's not even a viable way to provide even one parking space on the site as it's improved. Um, we would have to demolish some buildings. And again, they're historically significant. So we're trying to avoid that. So um, again, for the last over 50 years, the existing four-story principal building has contained a total of seven dwelling units, while the coach house has always contained two dwelling units. These were the existing conditions when the applicant acquired the property just over four years ago with the intent to renovate the units and bring the living conditions therein up to current standards. Um, again, why this is a little bit confusing on the face of it is because the denial and the application um, indicate that it's a four, that the principal building only contains two units. Again, that's because of discrepancies in the permit records. So as a result of those discrepancies, um, the permit records only indicated two existing dwelling units in the principal building. Um, as a result, in order to bring the existing seven units into conformity, even before we get to the parking, we sought a um, and effectuated a type one zoning map amendment to bring the underlying zoning designation for the property into compliance with the existing density. Um, we worked on that obviously with Alderman La Spada and that was ratified by city council back in the back in 2020. Um, so that zoning map amendment, which was tied to the plans that provide the basis for the variation application, um, addressed the non-conforming density. So the existing dwelling units at the property. Uh, towards that end, back in 2000. And 16, 2017, when the applicant acquired the property, all seven of the units in the four story principal building were occupied, as well as both of the units in the coach house. Again, those conditions have been maintained um, throughout the applicant's management of the property. The only modifications were they did want to undertake some interior renovations of the units just to bring them up to code and standard. And that's kind of what precipitated um, all of this relief is because they were trying to do things the right way in getting permits to do those renovations. And that's when they first learned about these discrepancies in the permit history. So um, that's the gist of it. The hardship, so to speak, is again, the fact that we're dealing with these two structures that have been there for over 100 years, have been fully occupied, and which such structures occupy almost the entirety of the site, thereby precluding um, the any parking accommodations for the property. Towards that end, um, Mr. Krieger and Campbell Street has managed the property for almost five years. They manage many other properties, residential properties, not just in this neighborhood, but throughout the city. Mr. Krieger is at the site pretty regularly because they own other buildings in the area. Um, parking is not an issue in that neighborhood. Um, there's always street parking, believe it or not. And towards that end, in the five years that they have been managing the property at full occupancy, the most the most number of cars that any of the tenants have ever had is maybe two or three tenants at a time would have a vehicle. And again, they've always been able to find street parking. Um, so we will not be changing the way that the building has been occupied or functioned for again, well over 50 years thereby, so hopefully not having any type of adverse impact on the adjacent properties and or the neighborhood. So with that, um, unless there's any preliminary questions, I will go ahead and get my witnesses on the record real quick um, and then just open it up for questions. Yep, go ahead, Councilor. Okay, Mr. Krieger, um, can you please uh, state once more your name and address for the record. Uh, yes, Joshua Krieger, 111 East Chestnut Street, Chicago. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Krieger, as I indicated, you, uh, by and through your company, own and manage the subject residential property. Is that true? 
That's correct, yes. Um, and to date, all, I believe all nine of the um, units are currently occupied? Yes, that is correct. And pursuant to a community benefit agreement with the local community organizations and Alderman Lisbada, those units are actually being offered at affordable rents. Is that true? That is correct. All of them are. All nine of the units are affordable. Correct. And that's for a period of at least 15 years. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And that's basically the goal of Campbell Street. So most of your properties, you um, go into the communities and you work with them towards those types of considerations. Is that right? Yes. Thank you. Um, and then as I indicated, you are familiar with the subject property. You've been managing it for five years. Has there ever been an instance where parking has been a concern for any of your tenants? Uh, no, it's never been a concern for tenants. I'm there regularly at all hours of the day, all days seven days a week, and I've, I've never had an issue finding parking. Um, it's also very uh, well located, proximate to multiple CTA bus lines. Um, so there's Western California and Division very close by that people take advantage of, I know. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, and this has been kind of a lengthy process for you um, procedurally. You've been working on this for about two years. Again, just kind of cleaning up the permit records, is that right? That's correct, yes. And you um, and your company have invested a significant, almost $2 million towards um, the permitting and renovations to the building. Is that right? That's right. About a million seven fifty at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, and at full occupancy with the affordable units, um, you probably don't stand to even start to really appreciate any sort of revenue against that investment for several years. Is that true? Uh, yeah, I think the math came out to about 15 years. Okay, thank you. Um, that's it for me for now, Mr. Fuhrer, but um, if you were to continue to testify prior to these prior to these proceedings, you were provided with findings of fact as well as an affidavit, which you executed. If you were to continue to testify here today, would your testimony be consistent with the statements that were made in those documents? Uh, yes, it most definitely would. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Chairman, I would like to note for the record, because um, I know that the forms have become of utmost importance to this board and rightfully so, we submitted our findings of fact um, for this case back in January or February, I believe, prior to the change in the rules on the um, with the forms for the economic analysis. So our Exhibit D is still based on using the old forms. But I think that it should have provided you with all of the information that the new forms do. Yeah, yeah we, did that. we did it on this one. And also, it, this was like the, the last month. I won't make a fuss about that. <laughs> okay, I, I just wanted to. That, but you are correct that we do love our forms. So let's put that I on. Know. And I do actually, they make my explanation a lot easier. So thank you. Um, so with no further ado, Mr. Wang, can you please state your name and address for the record once more? Yes, Andrew Wang, 5639 North Palman Avenue, Chicago, Illinois, 60659. Thank you, Mr. Wang. And um, you are a licensed architect in the state of Illinois, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And you were um, retained by the applicant in order to create the programming for the renovation um, and permitting of the existing improvements, is that right? Uh, that's correct, our office was, yes. Um, and as I indicated, uh, one of the hardships here um, is that we're dealing, you as an architect are dealing with two existing buildings, the original construction of which um, are almost 100 years old and you can't change the footprint, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And as a result, um, no matter how hard you try, I think it'd be not just impractical, but impossible to get even a single um, parking space on this lot as improved. Is that right? That's right. I mean, without significant demolition of the existing buildings, uh, there's just no way to get the parking on the site. Okay, thank you. Um, so then, Mr. Wang, is it um, your professional opinion that the programming for the improvements, um, even with the elimination of the required off-street parking, that we still meet all of the standards and requirements for a variation as set forth in the current zoning ordinance? 
Yes, that's correct. Thank you. And Mr. Wang, you too were provided with an affidavit as well as a copy of the applicant's findings of fact prior to these proceedings. If you were to continue to testify here today, would your testimony be consistent with those statements made in those documents? Uh, yes, I would. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Um, Mr. Chairman, that's all from me from our witnesses. But again, we'd be very happy to answer questions. Okay. Yeah. Well, any questions from the board? Yeah, I do. This is Commissioner Toya. Um, you mentioned uh, you're charging affordable rents. What is affordable rents? Who set the guidelines on affordable rents in uh, this part of town? So, um, thank you, Ms. Or Commissioner Toya. Great question. I can let Josh expound on that. So, again, we worked with Alderman Lespada's office for several months. Prior here to um, the affordable rents were determined based on the area median income of this particular neighborhood. So instead of using the same broader generalization that the um, Department of Housing uses in applying the affordable requirements ordinance, we actually went into this neighborhood and determined what about a 60% AMI was for this neighborhood. And that's how those were set using um, the market rate rents for similar units in that neighborhood. Um, and in exhibit D, and as well as in the findings of fact, we provide the specifics on those units. Um, but I can tell you, really quick Lily what they are I think um so the one bedroom units will go for um between 1300 and 1400 the two bedroom units um and there's excuse me there's six one bedroom units commissioner the two mm -hmm. bedroom unit the two bedroom units for which there are two of those those are gonna um, be rented for 1400 up to 1600 over the period of the 15 years, depending on if the market rates increase. And then the three bedroom unit, um, which there's only one, um, is right about 1700. Um, and again, that's about 60% of what the market rate is in this neighborhood based on the area median income of the residents of the same neighborhood. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions from the board? Okay, sounds like it has what we have what we need. Um, we'll take this under consideration and thank you everyone for your time and responses. Thank you, thank you. so much. Thank you. Yep. Okay, next up, um, calendar number 215-21-Z. This is at 2863 South Keeley Street, and I believe it starts a string of, um, a string of Councillor Moore, call it the Councillor Moore Special. So when you're on, let us know. I, I am here, thank you very much. And hopefully we have uh, Antonio Rendon and maybe his uh, wife and uh, John Pimentel, who is the architect. Yep, I see John. Um, here. I'm also here, present. Great, perfect. If you, if you would please swear them in, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yep, um, Antonio, can you please state your name and address? Sure. My name is Antonio Rendon. I live on 2863 South Keeley Street in Chicago, Illinois, 60608. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Pimentel, um, please state your name and address. Yeah, John Pimentel from PMPC Architects, 965 West Chicago in Chicago, Illinois. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Antonio, uh, you grew up on the South Side, is that right? That's correct. And uh, you uh, more recently met your wife, uh, is that right? Uh, that is correct. And you and she uh, looked around and found this two flat that you wanna renovate into a single family home. And uh, basically 
for the foreseeable future raise your family there. Is that right? Yep, that and is correct. And you're living there now. And as a matter of fact, you had your first child in January. Is that right? Uh, November. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so you have a six month old. Yes. Or a seven month old. Yes. And um, the uh, there's several little problems with the house, which the architect can tell us about. But one is it's a vaulted sidewalk. So the first floor is, the, the, is down below the sidewalk. Is that right? Yep. And it's a through a uh, lot, so it faces Keeley. Your front door is on Keeley, uh, but the garage uh, is is back on um, Medill Street. Is that right? Uh, almost correct. Uh, it's not Medill Avenue. It is Farrell Street. Oh, I'm sorry. So that's that's our mistake. We had a typo there. The the through street, the street at the other end of the lot, is Farrell, not Medill. Correct. Okay. And um, then this, uh, how old is your building? I couldn't tell you. I don't know. Uh, people have told me it's more than 75 years old. Okay. And um, in any case, it was built, its outline was built before uh, the zoning code in 1958. Is that right? Most more than likely, yes. And so it was built before the setback rules were made. And what you're asking to do is put another floor on it uh, to house your bedrooms, et cetera, and uh, to follow the exact same outline of the house as it is now, except it'll uh, be one floor higher. Is that right? Correct. And um, therefore, it'll, since it's non conforming already, the uh, side yards will be uh, closer to the lot line than they otherwise uh, would be if you were building it new. Is that right? Uh, correct. And uh, here we have a picture of the back. You're going to build a garage there, are you? Uh, the garage is already present. That uh, is from Google Maps, which is uh, slightly outdated. Okay. But in any case, um, because it's a through lot, um, and the architect can tell us that the the zoning code looks at it as a front yard. So to park in it, you have to have a variance, a rear yard variance as well. Is that right? I believe so, yes. Okay, well, he'll tell us that. And so in any case, um, you and I worked out a uh, affidavit where you addressed all the criteria necessary for this board to grant the two variances, the side yard and the rear yard that you're requesting. If you were to continue to testify, you'd testify consistently with that. Is that right? Yes. And uh, John, you're, uh, you're with the architectural firm that has made the plans to convert, deconvert this into a single family. Is that right? That's correct. And you've testified in front of this board before. Uh, is that right? That's correct. And um, you, uh, you tell briefly tell the board what the hardships are in deconverting this into a, a, a single family from the existing building? Yeah, so it's currently set up as a two unit building. Um, one unit is currently in the basement or the garden level, and then the other one's on the first floor. We're deconverting and adding a second floor, which um, because of the setback requirements, we don't meet the setbacks on the side um, of the house. So that's one issue. So we're trying to reduce the required setbacks. The other issue is that the garage uh, was built um, and it does not meet, again, the setbacks because that garage is facing a street and not a typical alley situation as you would have in, in most of the lots in Chicago. And um, your plan, however, would then comply with if these variances are granted with all um, ordinances and regulations of the city, is that right? That's correct. And it, you and I worked out an affidavit. If you were to continue to testify, you'd testify consistently with it. Is that right? That's correct. Um, that's all we have. And both gentlemen are available for questions. OK, great. Thank you, everyone. Um, any questions from the board? OK, we'll take this under consideration. Thank you very much for coming in today. All right, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Have a good one. 
Okay, next up, calendar number 216-21-Z at 3531 North Paulina. So hopefully we have uh, Tricia and Monte Lus Lusuter, and I believe they're um, either on their cell phone, or either by phone or on their um, camera on their cell phone because they were inextricably uh, traveling today. And then we have uh, an architect, Sam Kang. Okay, great. Let's see if we have um, Patricia and Monte. Let us know if you're on. Yes, we are here. Great, great. So let's get you sworn in. Um, uh, Patricia, can you please state your name and address? Sure. Uh, Patricia McCreary Luzatter, 3531 North Palina Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60657. Thank you. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes. Great. And in uh, and, and Monte, um, please state your name and address. Yes, it's, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Monte Luzetter, 3531 North Polina Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60657. Thanks, and do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? I do. Perfect. And then finally, we've got um, Sam Kang. Uh, Mr. Kang, can you state your name and address? My name is Sam Kang from Aram Architects from 6825 North Lincoln Avenue, Lincolnwood, Illinois, 60712. Thank you, and do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, Monte, uh, how long have you and Tricia owned this house? Yeah, we've lived there uh, 22 years next month. And um, who do you live there with? So we have, uh, we have three children we raised in this house. Uh, two of them are still living with us. And... Um, one is off to law school to follow in your footsteps, Tom. Uh oh, uh, just what the world needs. Um, <laughs> so, uh, one of the children who is remaining with you has special needs and will probably continue to live with you as an adult. Is that right? That's correct. Yes, our twenty-year-old daughter uh, has Down syndrome. Okay, and so um, because she's now an adult, uh, what got you thinking about building a? Um, in addition to the back of your house is that uh, you wanted to give her some space um, to be an adult in the house with you. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And also, you, is it you or your wife who has a elderly dad who may also not be able to continue to independently live? Yes, that's my father. He's uh, okay. turning 87. Okay. So, in any case, um, you hired an architect to build this house, but how old, how old is the house? I mean, my understanding is it's 125 years old. Okay, so it's the only issue that we're coming to the board with is a north side yard, uh, because you actually have a full lot to the, uh, on the south side of the building, is that right? Uh, correct. And so all you're doing is extending the existing walls uh, back into the uh, uh, back, uh, but not so much that you need a rear yard setback. So all we're asking for is a north side setback. Is that right? And a com combination too, right? Right. Just uh, we're just. And actually, to keep... as we see in this picture, the building to your north goes way back, way beyond your house. Is that right? Yes, it does. And you know that neighbor, and as a matter of fact, that neighbor is doing some improvements and wants your support. And independent of that, he has always uh, said they are absolutely supportive of your request. Is that right? Yes, we've uh, we've kept them informed all along of what what we were planning to do, and and they have no problem with it. Okay. Um, that's all I ask of Monte. Um, Mr. Kang, are you here? Yes. And uh, you, sir, were asked to um, design a uh, code compliant addition to this house. And the problem is, the hardship is that the house is already uh, at or near the, lot, the north lot line. Is that right? Yes. And so, but if this variance is granted, uh, your design will otherwise comply with all of the codes 
and rules and regulations of the city ordinances. Is that right? Yes. And you and I addressed a uh, your affidavit wherein you uh, addressed all of the criteria necessary for this board to grant this variance. And if you were to continue to testify, you'd testify consistently with it. Is that right? Yes. Um, Mr. Chairman, that's pretty much our case in chief. Uh, both of these, all three of these people are available for questions. Great. Any questions from the board on this one? Okay, I think we've got a good view. Thank you everyone for coming in today and we'll take this under consideration. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yep. All right, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, now we've got calendar number 217-21-Z. And this is at 3635 North Jansen Avenue. So hopefully I have either Courtney Thayer and Catherine uh, Raisdell. Yep, um, you, you've got Courtney on. So we have Courtney and uh, their architect, uh, Seth Ramick. And uh, there was some possibility that Alderman uh, Tony was going to. Uh, yeah, Tom, I think he's here. Um, so Alderman, can you, are you on? I am, thank you. Good Great. afternoon, everybody. Great, hey Alderman, so um, we always ask, do you want to speak up front on this matter or on the back end? No, uh, thank you. I'll listen to the testimony and then speak afterwards. Thank you. Sounds great, yep, thanks for coming. Okay, go ahead, mm -hmm. Tom. Well, would you like to swear in uh, Courtney and uh, uh, Seth? Yes, perfect. Um, Ms. Thayer, can you please state your name and address? Sure, Courtney Thayer. I live at 3635 North Jansen in Chicago, 60613. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceeding? I do. Thank you very much. Um, and remind me, do we have Ms. Blaze though? No, unfortunately she's a teacher and this is, uh, she was, couldn't come out, couldn't get out of her class. No worries, not not required. So, um, Mr. Romig, uh, please state your name and address. Uh, my name is Seth Romig. My address is 325 Dempster Street in Evanston, Illinois. <coughs> I apologize. Sure. Sorry, this is sorry, this is the court reporter. I can't hear you, sir. Oh, uh, is that better? Yes. Or am I having an issue with my? It's better now. You can go ahead. Okay. Uh, my name is Seth Romig and I am at 325 Dempster Street in Evanston, Illinois, 60201. Great, and do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes. Perfect. Um, so Courtney, would you tell the board a little bit about your house and household and who lives there with you and how long you've been there? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, my wife and I bought the house in 2006. Um, the house is uh, was built in 1865, which is, as I believe, one year before the Chicago fire. Um, and in that house, we've raised our, our three kids who are uh, almost 13 and 11 and seven. And uh, yeah, so we've, we've lived there, we've raised the kids and we're kind of excited to continue to live there and raise uh, good urban children. Okay, so, and you're asking for a rear yard setback uh, to uh, build a, um, what is commonly called a breezeway, but you're going to do it below level. Uh, um, and yep. will you tell the board why you're asking for that? Yeah, sure. That then that's exactly what we're trying to build. We, um, you know, we worked really hard with, with Seth to try to build something or to come up with something that solved the problem, but didn't um, cause any inconvenience to our neighbors who we're all we're friends with. So the neighbor to the, the south is a single family home, but they rent it. They live in Ohio and have been renting the house for a while, but are, we're very friendly with the, um, the neighbors who now live in Ohio. Um, and then the house to the north is a three, I think it's three building or three apartment, it might be four apartment building. Um, and that's what sits to the north. Um, but what we're trying to do is, you know, frankly, um, with some construction of the jewel that happened after we bought the house, uh, the changing of the loading docks and a number of things, we've got a couple things going on. One of them is the rats that run up on the deck on a regular basis. Um, you know, when we walk out of the garage, they are sitting there, they jump out at the kids when they go to take the, the garbage out. Um, I, I just frankly am, and 
I can't, you know, I'm, I'm frightened to death of every time that they jump out and can't afford to have the kids um, bitten. So we park on the street um, instead of using our garage. So one of the things I'm trying to do is just have an easy access that we can get the kids safely from the, the garage into the house um, after, after after dusk, which is when they routinely come home or my wife comes home from, you know, from teaching. Um, and then the other thing is um, my wife, Catherine, is, has asthma and knock on wood, the kids do not yet um, have asthma. Hopefully they will not get it. But the, the trucks back up right behind the garage with the moving of the loading dock with the construction of the jewel. And so that air, um, especially in certain times of, of year, comes floating into the backyard. So again, um, trying to make uh, the ability to access the garage and get into the house without um, you know, either surprising a rat and having one jump out like they, they do today, and to, to avoid the, uh, you know, the air pollution as a result of the, the trucks that, um, you know, gets to respiratory problems. So those, so, are, those are really what we're trying to tackle. So Courtney, how does this, this uh, proximity, uh, how, how close are you to how many loading docks at the um, jewel behind uh, across the alley? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so the, the jewel is directly behind the house. One of the loading docks is directly behind um, behind my house. In fact, when we used to use the garage, you know, I used to have to routinely ask the trucks to, to back up and they always did, they were they were great. Um, and then the other loading dock, I'm gonna guess is about a hundred yards to the north. Um, but so while they're waiting, you know, while a truck's in the loading dock, they will kind of stack up sitting behind the house. That's kind of the, the queuing area. But so, um... This board uh, grants variances uh, based on uh, something physical about the lot or its proximity, um, and and what is, how does that relate to your problem with the rats? Yeah, I think it's I think it's twofold. It's one is you know with the the way the jewel is constructed and the way the dock the loading docks are set are now set with the construction of it. They you know. We uniquely, as probably one of the only houses, has is the is the loading the place where the trucks sit. Um, they don't sit behind my neighbors. They they sit behind our house. So that's that's one. And I think the second one is just with um, you know directly behind the house is where all the dumpsters are for the for the jewel. So all the old food and things like that go into these dumpsters, which sit directly behind the house. And you know I, I get it. There's rats everywhere in the city, but I think given the the the, the easy access to you know a good food source they come into the yard enough that we've got sinkholes that are six feet deep that we hire somebody to fill in on a regular basis. And um, we, as I said, we don't park in the garage because of those rats living there. And we've, for the last five and a half years, as of many neighbors, but we've hired an independent, um, you know, rat person. They're called the, the men in black and they come routinely and they set traps and set baits and, and those kind of things, which, you know, again, there's rats all over the city, but I think because of the jewel and because the dumpsters sit directly behind the house, we tend to get, at least in conversations with the neighbors, the preponderance of the, uh, the rats coming to live in our backyard. And so um, you and I worked out an affidavit where you addressed all of the criteria necessary for this board to grant the variance you're requesting. And if you were to continue to testify, you'd testify consistently with it and you'll be available for questions as well. Is that right? Ab absolutely, yeah. And Seth, um, you're a licensed architect in Illinois, is that right? Yes, I am. And you've testified before this board before, have you? I have. And um, what what hardship did you encounter in um, trying to um, uh, accommodate your client's uh, request in this on this case? Sure. Well. Uh, Funny enough, I also suffer from asthma. And when, you know, documenting the existing conditions of the home, I noted how much exhaust there was, um, you know, sitting in the back alley because I could feel it and not feel very good, frankly. Um, and when discussing the renovation and reinvestment in this property with Courtney and Catherine, um, you know, one of the things that I asked my clients is, are, is there anything that you're particularly scared of, anything you're particularly worried about, any any individual things about this property that we need to address? And they both kind of looked at each other and then looked at me and kind of said at the same time, almost like a TV show, rats. We hate rats. There are a lot of rats. Um, and uh, I think Catherine even told me that she has dreams of rats carrying away her house. Um, so, you know, obviously that's a 
pretty, uh, pretty heavy handed way for me to hear as a designer, um, something that we could actually help. And so we've designed this new garage. We determined that eliminating the existing garage is probably a really important first step to eliminate habitats. Um, and we're gonna build it out of uh, masonry materials to discourage rats from gnawing through. Um, we're gonna take away the existing wood frame deck that's in the back and we're gonna build a raised patio. All of these things um, are within the current uh, zoning ordinance requirements. And on top of that, we talked a little bit about this idea that, you know, maybe what we could do is actually design a, a connection, an interior connection from the house to the garage. And we could design at the basement level so that from the ex exterior, you really don't see a difference between what we would improve the property with if we didn't have the basement connection. So we'd have as little, if any, um, impact on the neighbors with this basement connection. And that's what we're here asking you for permission today um, to really uh, make this a, a properly livable space for this family so that they can reinvest in the property and be there for many years. And what about the location of this lot vis-a-vis -vis the, the jewel and its loading docks uh, adds to the hardship that you've described? Well, um, as you know, Courtney mentioned earlier, it's directly across the alley from the dumpster area. And um, while I'm sure the Jewel people do as best they can to mitigate rodents and, and to limit the amount of debris, there are always you know, several traps out there. There's you know, lots of signs of rats um, caving in pavers in the backyard, um, all sorts of things that, that you know, somebody can see just walking up and down the alley. Um, there's a pretty significant rat population there. And then, um, you know, there are two loading docks. One is, again, you know, if you go out of their garage, you look to the right and there's the dumpster, you look to the left and that's the smaller loading dock. And then on the other side, you know, I think Courtney may have said hundred yards, I think it's more like hundred feet um, to the north is the main loading dock. And so the, the trucks queue up there. Um, and, you know, while in nice weather, um, with a nice breeze, it's quite lovely to be in their backyard. In other circumstances, it's it's really not, um, and so it does change day to day. But it's a uh, it, you know, in 20 years of designing homes in Chicago, um, you know, this is the first time I've encountered something where the exhaust and and you know the rat population is an obvious variation from what I typically see. And. Um... You and I uh, worked out an affidavit where you addressed all of the criteria necessary for this board to grant the variance if uh, uh, if they see fit. And if you were to continue to testify, you'd testify consistently with that affidavit. Is that right? Yes, of course. Um, that's uh, what I have from my witnesses. Uh, and um, uh, I did meet uh, Miss uh, Alderman Tunney over at this property with the uh, um, applicant and the architect, uh, but uh, I think Mr. Tunney can ask can answer, can uh, make his own statement uh, without me asking him questions. Yeah, maybe um, unless the alderman wants to speak now, maybe we take a few. I've just got some pretty straightforward questions. Um, so, okay, so just so everyone has a visual of this, because this is different than we somewhat see. And correct me if I'm explaining it wrong, because I'm really explaining it <laughs> for you to tell me if this is a right visual or not. So the, how we view a connector is usually something in the air. It's, it affects green space and permeability. This is fully underground. It's like a narrow extension of the basement that then you pop up into the garage, correct? Yes, that's absolutely correct. We, uh... We designed it so that the it's it's underneath the raised patio in the backyard, and um, and the stair that goes from that lower level up to the garage level is actually stacked underneath the um, you know permissible stair for accessing the garage roof deck. Got it. And that that permissible stair um, is on the exterior of the garage, correct? Correct. 
but it runs with the wall of the garage, which we all, it's like, we all refer to as like a Hopkins stair. That's correct. You can actually see it on the screen currently in elevation drawing number one. Yep. You can see that staggered upper stair um, and the lower level stair is stacked directly underneath that. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you for clarifying um, all that. Any other questions from the board before we go to the alderman? Yeah, this is Commissioner Esposito. Could you just, I'm sorry to circle back, maybe the same clarification. You say this passageway is located under the raised deck. Is it completely below grade? It is not completely below grade. Um, it is partially buried like the basement level is. And how much is above grade? So the top of the raised patio is at 48 inches above adjacent grade. And the passageway meets that, I take it? The passageway is underneath, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions from the board? Okay, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna go to the alderman, and then maybe we'll have a few more questions. Um, alderman Tony, are you still on? Uh, yes, Chairman, I'm still on. Um, and uh, I think the questions and the testimony by both the architect and uh, the attorney reflect my uh, personal visit to the property. Um, I don't want to be remiss saying that the city is not doing its job in rodent control but I believe it is a unique circumstance uh, with the loading docks and the garbage area immediately behind this house. Um, in regards to what normally is uh, connectors above grade, um, this I think is uh, an adequate um, under, under grade, so to speak, or under four feet connector between the front of the house and the back that I think minimizes the uh, opposition from immediate neighbors generally, which we feel with these, ro with these raised um, uh, decks and walls and stuff. So I think it's a, I think it's a, a creative solution. Um, and um, I know that the couple has lived in the ward and would like to reinvest in their property. Um, I think it's a creative use and I'm in support of it. And, uh, you know, while it's unique, I think what's important is that this project, as stated in front of the board, uh, probably more so meets with neighborhood support or neighbor support, not neighborhood support, but neighbor support than the, the, the typical raised connector from the house to the garage. So I'm in support of it. Uh, we'd love to keep the family in the, in the neighborhood and um, I'm, I'm not going to uh, minimize the amount of uh, calls for service in regards to rodent control. We have worked with, with Jewel, and, um, but the, the case of with the, the, the couple, their children, um, we want them to stay. The neighbors are okay with it, and I'm okay with it. So I'm, I'm available for questions also. Thank you. Yep, thanks, Alderman, and thank you. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for coming in today. Um, any questions from the board? Yeah, Go I have ahead. a question for you, Alderman. Okay. Alderman, um, as we know, you have a lot, you know, there's rodents throughout the 44th ward, all wards really, but would you say the rodent population in this part of the, in a western part of the ward here is higher than other parts of the ward? Uh, thank you for the question, Sam. I think it's proximity to the loading docks and the garbage is somewhat unique. I'm not saying that it's, um, uh, there maybe there might be a situation around the Marianos over there by Broadway and Wellington, but mm -hmm. I think this this is literally thirty, you know, the alley width, which is probably sixteen feet away, um, and um, I think it's um, I think it's appropriate that uh, the combination what the request is under basically four feet or under the connector I think is fine. Um, I think they've obviously got to build a new garage and they got to rebuild a new deck. And I think the plan the architect put forward meets with the support of the neighbors and will hopefully um, uh, clean up the situation for their individual property in terms of rodent control. 
It'll never completely though, Sam, as you well know. So. Yes. Thank you, Alderman. Any other questions from the board? Okay, sounds like none. We'll take this under consideration and um, thanks everyone for coming in and uh, explaining to us. Yeah. Thanks, Thank you thanks very much. much. Yep. Thanks to the board members. I hope someday we'll see you in the council together. So. Yeah. Yes, you know, you might agreed. Be I think. Um, okay, great. So we're gonna move on to calendar number 218. 21 B, and this is at 4008 12 North Lincoln Avenue. So, Mr. Chairman, this is my last case, and we should have um, one of the owners, uh, Mr. Schwartz or Mr. Schiller, and also uh, an architect, Victor, um, who uh, uh, as our um, witnesses. Okay, great. Let's see. Um, is uh, is Mr. Schwartz on? Chairman, I don't see uh, any of them. Okay. Uh, they're signed in on a different name. They can raise their hand virtually. Yeah, thank, thank you, Kamala. Let's see. If they're not here, Mr. Chairman, if you would please pass the case, I'll chase them and find them. Okay. Um, yep, yeah, I don't see them. So what we'll do, we'll go to the next matter and then um, we'll circle right back. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll keep you informed. Okay, thank you. All right. So calendar number 220-21-Z. And this is uh, John Pekarski as counselor. John, let us know if you're on. Oh, I see you, I see you on and you are, you were unmuted. Um, it looks like you're muted now, John. Oh, now it's muted, right? Yeah, wait, John, John, we can hear you now. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Okay, good, af good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. John Pekarski for the applicant, Robert Bernstein, uh, and the property at uh, 2432 West Dakin. Uh, I have with me uh, Mr. Bernstein, and our architect, Victor Drabshaw, uh, who uh, was here on the last case, so I assume he's still here. Uh, simply put, all we are trying to do is to put a sunroom over the existing porch of the building. Uh, it is a, uh, a very small uh, uh, addition. Uh, to the second floor of the uh, of the home, uh, the uh, property is located directly across the street from someone else who has done exactly the same thing. As you can see by the uh, photograph, the uh, there is a uh, a porch uh, extending from the second story, and all we're doing is covering that porch uh, and then uh, adding windows all the way around. Uh, it'll be an increase uh, to the uh, uh, to the second floor uh, and, and just off of the master bedroom. 
uh, the variation is created by the fact that uh, the porch is already existing uh, and uh, uh, we are simply covering it. Um, the client is, is in the construction business and is doing the work himself uh, so that uh, we're talking about a, a minuscule amount of, of uh, money, but uh, uh, again, a quality of life issue for uh, the family uh, that lives there. Um, I would uh, call as my first witness the uh, applicant, Bob Bernstein. Bob, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Now, uh, how long have you owned the building, Bob? In one uh, second, one so second. Sorry, John and Bob. Um, Bob, I'd like to get you sworn on really quick. Sure. Uh, so can you please state your name and address? Uh, Robert Bernstein, 2432 West Dakin Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60618. Great, thank you. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes, I do. Great, go right ahead, John. Okay, uh, Bob, how long have you owned this building? Uh, we've been there 20 years. Okay. And you and your family live there? Yes, sir. And you would like to uh, cover the existing uh, open sun porch uh, and make it uh, uh, more tolerable for uh, all four seasons of the year. Is that correct? That's exactly correct, John. Okay. And uh, you are in the trades, so you're going to do this work yourself. Is that correct? Yes, it is. I've, I've uh, been a, uh, a licensed GC and a rehabber for 30 years. And uh, I've, that's just all I really know. It's construction. And, and uh, the idea for this cover is uh, was generated by the fact that the people across the street have exactly the same thing that you do. Is that correct? Or that you're seeing? That, yes, yes, that is. And it's something I always admired you know, having that uh, covered front porch. Fine. Uh, in, in your opinion, <laughs> will this uh, proposal in any way alter the essential character of the neighborhood in which it's located? No, it will not. Okay. And so it, in your opinion, then the proposed use is compatible with the uh, uh, neighborhood. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. And have I prepared on your behalf an affidavit which has been furnished to the board? Yes, you have. And if I ask you the questions and answers that appear in that affidavit, would your answers be the same or substantially similar? Yes, sir. Okay, I have no further questions of Bob. Okay, great. John, do you wanna um, uh, uh, get on the, um, get on, on Victor? I'm sorry. Do you want to ask any questions of Victor? Yes, I, I would like to present uh, the architect, Victor Grabshaw. Victor, Perfect. are you there? Yes, I am. Okay, uh, Victor, uh, please state your name, address, and occupation, and you have already been sworn in at the last hearing. Is that correct? Uh, not yet. So uh, my my name is Victor Grabshaw, licensed architect in uh, Illinois. The uh, owner of Red Architects, 2123 North. And Victor, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes, I do. Thank you very much. And you've drawn the plans for the uh, enclosure uh, of the uh, roof, uh, for the creation of the roof and enclosure of the uh, uh, second story of the porch of this building. Is that correct? Yes. In your opinion, Will the uh, building uh, that is proposed uh, in any way alter the essential character of the neighborhood in which it's located? No, it would not. Okay. And is it compatible with uh, the surrounding neighbors? Yes, I would say yes, it is. Okay. And I've, have I prepared on your behalf an affidavit uh, that has been submitted to the board? Yes, you did. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, if I ask you the same questions that appear in the affidavit, would your answers be the same or substantially similar? Yes, they would be. Okay. I have no further questions of Victor. Okay, great, thank you, John. Any questions from the board?
Okay, sounds like we've got enough. We'll take this under consideration. Um, thank you everyone for your time today. Thank you and have a good thank weekend. You. you too, you too. Thanks, John. All right, we're gonna scroll back um, to calendar number 218-21-Z um, to see if Tom and Michael Schwartz uh, or was it, were able to get on. And Tom, I think you're on mute. Sorry, we're, we're, we apologize for the confusion. Uh, if you could now swear Mr. Schwartz and Victor, who you just swore, it will also be here. Yep, Victor Zahn. Uh, Mr. Schwartz, can you state your name and address, please? Michael N. Schwartz, 2042 West Belmont Avenue, Chicago, 60618. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? I do. Great. Mr. Schwartz, you um, have been working on this project for uh, last couple of years, is that right? That's correct. And this is the old Lincoln restaurant on um, Lincoln Avenue, just north of Irving that was there for many years. Is that right? That is right. And it's now a vacant lot and you hope to build a mixed use uh, building there. Uh, is that right? That is correct. And you went through a um, community process with Alderman Martin um, wherein, among other things, you agreed to have extra affordable units on site, um, and you worked out all the details with the alderman and the community, and uh, the alderman supported a type one uh, transit-oriented development at this location, uh, which is near um, the L. Is that right? That's all correct, Tom. And... Um, the only thing we're asking the board for, the, you have an odd shaped lot. It's really three 25 foot lots uh, uh, so for a total frontage on Lincoln Avenue of 75 feet, but two of the lots are very short. They're only about 76 feet and uh, there's only one that has access to the alley. So it's an odd shaped uh, rear lot line. Is that right? Yes. And so the, what we're asking for the board from the board is a uh, variance, uh, rear yard variance uh, to reduce it, it from 30 to 10 uh, to allow you to build this building that's otherwise um, as of right and code compliant uh, under the type one zoning that was passed. Uh, correct. Okay. And um, you've hired an architect who will testify next to comply with all other ordinances and rules and regulations. Is that right? Yes, we did. And you and I worked out an affidavit where you addressed each of the criteria necessary for the board to grant this rear yard variance. And if you were to continue to testify, you'd testify consistently with it. Is that right? That is right. Um, Victor, are you still there? Yes, I am. And. Uh, you're a licensed architect and you've testified before this board before even a few minutes ago. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. And um, we tell the board what the hardship is in designing this building um, that brings us before the board today. Of course. So obviously the hardship is the odd shaped lot. Um, and as it stated before, only one of the lots actually goes all the way fully to the alley. And the uh, other two lots are abutted to the um, another property. Um, so we had to squeeze that uh, building into um, this shape. Uh, basically, if we would have had a regular size lots, three lots, that would be perfectly uh, suitable building without any variances that would be requested uh, for the rear setback. Um, uh, but in this situation, we are faced with um, a very short lot on, on the 76 and a half foot side. So we're asking for a 10 and a quarter uh, foot uh, reduction. So, and you and I uh, 
worked on an affidavit where you addressed all of the criteria necessary for the board to uh, grant this requested variance. And if you were to continue to testify, you'd testify consistently with it. Is that right? Yes, I would. Uh, that is our case in chief. Uh, both of these gentlemen are available for questions. Yeah, you can, can you give us a little bit more of a summary on um, the economic analysis here? Um, mainly that there's no, I, I remember the note that there's no reasonable rate of return without the variance here. Mr. Schwartz, that would be your um, question. Yeah, if we were forced to build um, in accordance with the zoning code without any yard relief, um, with a 30 foot rear yard on, on such a small depth lot when you really look at the access, uh, there's no way that the project would be economically feasible. Um, the building would end up being way too small and uh, we wouldn't be able to justify the purchase price for the land, which has market rates. Yep. If I also add, uh, it would actually, we would lose all the rear units. That's what would actually happen. Okay. Yep. Any questions from the board? I have a sister Ling Sol. Um, what's behind um, the short part of the lot? What's that building and what's the use? Uh, Michael, I think you might know a little bit more about that. That, you talk about the buildings adjacent to us on the it's called the South Side. Um, I don't know my bearings. I was just saying behind um, the, short, the shorter part of the lot. So short. Yeah, the shorter part of the lot is is just the alley, and then you can see there's a two story commercial building that's on the South Side, and then a four story uh, mixed use building on the North Side. So on the so, left side. Is, of so the directly picture, behind it. Yeah, on the left side of this picture, there is a building. That's what I'm asking about. It, it, to yes. me, at least, it looks some kind of a storage uh, portion of some kind of a, um, you know, retail maybe or of some, uh, because it is only one story. As we could see it in this picture right now, there is a door uh, right in the center of it. Um, that's that's all. And to the right of it, obviously, is that passage, the access to our alley. Okay, so no one knows what it what that is. It's, it's an extension of a building that fronts on Irving. And I've never been inside of it, so I can't guarantee what's going on inside of there, but I think Victor is correct. That is just storage for that, for that use that's on Irving. Thank you. Right. So as we could see it in a uh, site plan over here. So this, this would be like the back of the building that is um, on Irving Park that faces the Irving Park and the rear of our lot actually abuts the, that back portion of it. So this is Commissioner Esposito. So in that case, what has the communication with the neighboring properties about this variance request been? Um, I, well, there, you know, everybody's been noticed about the variance request. Uh, there's a sign on the fence fronting on Lincoln, but there hasn't been any conversations with those neighbors. Um, and so I, I couldn't tell you anything more than they've been put on notice that we have filed for this request. Thank you. Other questions from the board? Okay, we'll take this under consideration. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right, we're gonna hop ahead for one um, out of order, and that's gonna take us to 231-21-S at 5405-11 West Madison Street. And I'll go ahead and read the department's recommendation. 
The Department of Planning, Planning and Development recommends approval to establish an outdoor rooftop patio to serve a proposed restaurant on the ground floor, provided that number one, the special use is issued solely to the applicant, Tanika Daniels. Number two, the development is consistent with the design and layout of the plans and drawings dated October 12th, 2020, with site plan, with roof plan, dated May 19th, 2021, prepared by Beehive. Number three, the proposed rooftop fence screening design and material complies with the requirements of the ICC building code, section 1513. Councillor Walker, are you present? Let's see. Mr. Walker, I see you, um, I see you on as panelists, but I think we've got to get you unmuted. Let's give him a minute. Sorry, Ms. Daniels, one second. No problem. He says he's on the call. I don't know why he's not yeah. connected. Yeah, he's, I see him too. He's muted and his, his camera uh, is off too. Should I call him on my phone and just have him on speaker so he can hear you? Um, it, it would be, he's got a, I, that sounds pretty complicated. Um, you know, let's see. Uh, Chairman, he can also call in via phone uh, if he's having trouble. Yeah. I think he's restarting. He sent me a message that he's restarting. So he's trying to get back on. Okay, let's give him one minute just because we're. Um... Oh, he's here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry, I, I jumped on a call. Oh, don't worry. Um, okay, great. So, uh, Councilor, we've read the department's recommendation, um, and you can go ahead and put on your case, and um, we'll get uh, Miss Daniel sworn in. Okay. So, um, the the case is um, about. Um, Ms. I'm sorry, Ms. Daniel seeking um, a special use to allow a proposed outdoor patio to be located on the rooftop to serve a proposed restaurant on the ground floor. Um, as you noted, Ms. Daniels is here, and I believe Joe Ryan might also be um, on the call. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Um, yeah, so we can um, we can hear from them now. Okay, perfect. So, yeah, Ms. Daniels, will you please state your name and address? Tanika Daniels, 3063 West Cooper's Grove Court, Blue Island, Illinois, 60406. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes. Perfect. And um, Joe is sworn in and recognized as an expert. Um, Thank so, you, Chairman. Yep. So um, you can put on the case from here, Ms. Daniels. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Just tell us a little bit, or have your counselor tell us a little bit, a bit about what brings you here today, if you oh. could give us a review, um, and we'll ask questions. Oh, okay. So I'm seeking a special use permit to allow for outdoor patio to be located on my rooftop. When I purchased the property back in October um, 2019, I decided to purchase in the Austin area because my family grew up there and I wanted to kind of restore the community and hire some employees right within the community to bring back um, beauty to the Austin community. I also have the support of the aldermen and the local businesses surrounding um, the area. 
Okay, great. Will you tell us a little bit about um, about the restaurant and lo just logistics, like how many people seat inside, how we'll get to the rooftop, um, how it at the rooftop, and how it will operate? So as far as the, in, the inside, they have increased the number of people that will be allowed inside the restaurant. It was a little bit lower due to COVID. Um, our architecture have the plans. They have been updated, but they will be able to access the rooftop from inside the restaurant, and there will be an exit on the back side of the restaurant. Great. And will there be alcohol served on the rooftop? Um, there will be in the restaurant as far as the rooftop, I presume, but as of now, we have to still get all the permits and everything um, required. Yep. That's right. And what, will the hours of the rooftop be different than that of the restaurant? Um, the restaurant hours will be from 11 to 12. The rooftop will close an hour before. Um, it's 11 to 12, Monday through Wednesday, and then 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Thursday through Sunday, but the rooftop will close an hour before. Okay, each day. great. And you, can you give us a little bit of a description about the surrounding area? Is it a residential area or are there other businesses? So my, on my side of the street is all commercial resident. I mean, it's commercial um, businesses um, across the street. There is another restaurant that has an outdoor patio and we have his full support. He also owns the building that's adjacent to my location. Um, there is a presumed, there is an apartment building there. He owns it. He's in support of it. Um, it's presumed empty now, but um, he is in support of us. And then to the west side of me, the veterans lot, I spoke with the ladies that maintain the lot and they were excited that I purchased it and that we're gonna start building up the area as well. Great. Okay, perfect. Questions from the board? Okay, Joe, Joe, do you have anything you wanna say on this one? Uh, Chairman, I did a report. I uh, examined each of the criteria that the board needs to grant a special use, and I found that it met all of the criteria. Great. Okay, perfect. Um, Ms. Daniels, out of curiosity, do you, do you plan to have music on the rooftop? And I guess my secondary question, someone on the call might know, are rooftop patios allowed to have music? Um, I do plan on it, but when I spoke with my... Um architecture and um, I spoke with my ar architecture and my attorney um, and they were in agreement to it. They had all the paperwork pulled up. So um, we got some permits and things coming in from the city that will allow it. So as of now, it's not on the rooftop, it's just inside, but we're working on it, yep. but I don't know. Great, because you've got to still develop the rooftop, right? Like it. it mm -hmm. The location didn't have it built yet. Um, okay, great. Questions from the board? Okay, we'll take this under consideration. Thank you so much, everyone. All right, thank you. Great, thank you. I appreciate it, Chairman. Thank you very much. Yep, of course. Congratulations. All right, thank bye. You. Bye. Bye. Have a great day. You too. Okay, we're going to circle back. Um, I believe I had it right that we are on matter number 223-21-Z at 2424 West Ferron Avenue Street. Um, Councilor Turner, let me know when you're present. I see Mr. Laura on, um, and I, I do see Pat Turner on. Pat, I think you're on mute.
and it looks like he's signing back in. Um, Mr. Lara, thanks for your patience. We're uh, we're having our normal Zoom Zoom issues, but they're never too big to overcome. Okay, let's give him one minute before we jump ahead because I do see the applicant on. Chairman, I think uh, Attorney Patrick Turner was having issues earlier he, uh, when we, when you were uh, postponing the cases. He may have to call in. Yeah, I actually, yeah, thanks, Kamal. I think he is, um, he signed in twice, which gives me hope that like the second one is going to work. I see him too. So, so Pat, if you unmute that one that you're on camera for right now. Can you hear me now, Mr. Chairman? Yes, yes. I am sorry about that. I've had nothing but issues on this one. <laughs> um, Ms. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Patrick Turner. Um, with offices at 33 North LaSalle Street. I represent Carlos Lara, the owner of the subject property, which is located at 2424 West Huron in Chicago and is located in an RS3 district. The property is improved with a single family residence that is over 130 years old as, and is in need of extensive repairs and updates. Uh, and is also located on a substandard lot measuring 24 by 122. Um, the owner is seeking variation, uh, variations to number one, reduce the required east side setback from the required two feet to 0.28 feet with the west side setback to stay at its existing 2.09 feet for a com total combined side setback reduction from required 4.8 to 2.37. I could go over that again if you'd like, but it's kind of a mouthful. Uh, and then secondly, to allow an expansion of the floor area in existence for 50 years of a permitted residential use, not to exceed 15% of the existing 2,399 square feet over the maximum allowable floor area of 2,647 square feet. Uh, for a total of 3,007 square feet. In order to allow a construction of a third floor addition to a rear deck to an existing two-story two flat with an attic. Now that is a mouthful. Um, uh, with me today hopefully is uh, my client Carlos Lara and uh, our architect Matt Nardella. Great, and Mr. Lara, I know you're on, because uh, I can see you. Uh, can you please state your name and address? Uh, Carlos Lara, 2424 West Huron. 2424 West Huron. 24, 24 Perfect, I got it. We, you know, the, for the transcript we need, but we can take the whole thing in Spanish, Carlos. Um, I'm just kidding, okay. too. So, mm -hmm. uh, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes. Yes. Perfect. And you know what I'm going to do, just so it's clean on the record, Carlos, um, whoever's with you and helping you with translation, I'm going to swear them in as well. Um, so if you could also please state your name and address. Yes, um, Brenda Lara, 2424 West Huron Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60612. 
Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. And you swear a firm to tell the truth in today's proceedings um, in as much as um, if you're translating for Carlos, you'll make sure he understands every question. You'll pose it to him as a question and we'll know that he's answering. Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. So let's, let's swear the architect in as well. Um, Matt Nardella, can you state your name and address, please? Matt Nardella, 2855 West Diversity, Chicago, 60647. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as my first witness, I'd like to uh, call Mr. Lara. Um, Mr. Lara, you've already stated your name and address for the record, but you are the owner of the, of the subject property, is that correct? Yes. And the subject property measures 24 by 122, so it is a substandard lot, is that correct? Yes. And it is currently improved with a brick two flat that is uh, over 100 year, 130 years old, is that correct? Yes. And your family currently resides in the top unit and rents the bottom unit, is that correct? Yes. You have been living in the building with your family for approximately 27 years, correct? Yes. And your family needs additional living space, so thus the proposed uh, reconstruction of the property, right? Yes, sir. Um, your plan is to keep and preserve many of the historic features of the home and construct a third floor addition and rear deck, is that correct? Yes, sir. And the addition will match the existing walls of the building? Yes, sir. And in order to do this project, we are seeking the variations that I explained earlier, is that correct? Yes, sir. And that it's your position that the, the property in its current state poses several hardships, is that correct? Yes, sir. First of all, it's 130 years old and there's mu uh, many functional up things that, are, that need to be updated, is that true? Yes, sir. And then secondly, we are, uh, as stated previously, the property is located on a substandard lot measuring 24 by 122 which is shorter and narrower than a standard city lot measuring 125 by 25, is that correct? Yes. Um, also, the building was constructed with the basement slightly below grade. And as such, the entire basement and all incoming services, utilities and connections are essentially located at grade, is that true? Yes. And because of this unique condition, the entire basement level of the building must be counted toward the maximum floor area ratio. Is that correct? Yes. Sir. Um, and in addition, the uh, the building, the way the existing building is orientated on the lot, it does not comply with the required setback requirements. In other words, um, it's an exi existing legal non-conforming structure. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, and all of these unique conditions make any improvement to the building challenging, if not impossible, without zoning relief. Is that your position? Yes, sir. And then you purchased the property approximately 27 years ago for $70,000, correct? Yes, sir. And your, the cost to renovate the building under the current plans uh, will be approximately $850,000. Is that true? Yes, sir. And your plan is to continue to reside in the property with your family, correct? Yes, sir. And you are making obviously a significant investment in this addition. Is yes. that true? And um, I had prepared an affidavit and sent it to you and you signed that affidavit. Do you remember that? Yes. And if you were to continue to testify, you would do so consistent with that affidavit, correct? Yes. I have no further questions, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board for Mr. Lara. Okay, you can um, ask any questions of your architect, Pat. Okay, Mr. Nardella, you've already stated your name uh, and address for the record, but you are a licensed architect in the state of Illinois, is that correct? Yes. Um, and you are the architect for the subject property? Yes. And the, uh, again, the plan is to construct a third floor addition and a rear deck onto the existing building, is, is correct? Yes. And the, the property poses several hardships, all of which I just went through with Mr. Laro. You would agree with those hardships? I agree, yes. Um, 
And again, would you agree that the unique conditions make any improvement to the building challenging, if not impossible, without the zoning relief we're requesting? Yes. Uh, is it your professional opinion that uh, strict compliance with the regulations and standards of the zoning ordinance would create practical difficulties and hardships for the existing building since the existing structure and narrow lot make it difficult to comply with the required side setback requirements? Yes. Uh, is it your professional opinion that these practical difficulties or hardships are due to unique circumstances, which are the existing building having been, is that it's approximately 130 years old, the narrow lot and the at grade basement? Yes. Uh, that these uh, unique circumstances are not generally applicable to other similarly situated properties? Yes. Uh, is it also your professional opinion uh, that the purpose of these variations are not based exclusively upon a desire to make more money out of the subject property? Correct. In fact, the owners plan to live in the home with their family and preserve many of the historic characteristics of the building. Is that correct? Yes. And in your professional opinion, these practical difficulty and particular hardships have not been created by any person presently having an interest in the property? Correct. And again, it's the, the narrow lot, the existing structure and the at grade basement are all um, have been associated with this property obviously for quite some time. Yes. Um, if the variations were granted in your professional opinion, they will not be detrimental to the public welfare or injurious to other property or improvements in the neighborhood in which the property is located? Yes. Uh, in your professional opinion, opinion um, the proposed variation will not impair an adequate supply of light or air to adjacent property or substantially increase congestion in the public streets, uh, again, due to the fact uh, of the existing building with the rear addition will remain. Correct. And uh, lastly, in your professional opinion, the proposed variations will not increase the danger of fire or endanger the public safety since the existing building will remain and the addition will be aligned with it. It would probably lessen the danger, but yes. Okay, thank you for that. Um, in fact, strict compliance with the code in this case would severely limit the renovation options for this building. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, as I did with Mr. Lara, I prepared an affidavit and sent to you for your review and signature, correct? Yes. And if you would continue to testify here this afternoon, you would do so consistent with that affidavit? Yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, I have no further questions for Mr. Nardella and we would welcome uh, any questions you may have. Yep, great, thank you, Councilor. Um, any questions from the board on this one? Yeah, this is Commissioner Toy. I have a question. So you mentioned that it's a substandard lot. Uh, is, it, is it a substandard lot just for this piece of property on that block or are all the lots substandard on that block? Um, I do have, if you grant, give me a minute, I think I have the 80 acre map and I can be able to answer that. I'm not sure. I mean, you hand. brought it up. So I thought you had the answer. You said it was a substandard lot. So now I'm just trying to get my head around it. Is it the whole block or is it just this one piece of property? Again, Mr. Toya, Chairman Toya, I, I do not have the answer to that. Um, I'm trying to dig up the uh, 80 acre map. Uh, I just figured you did since you brought it up. Okay, I'm waiting. Well, I, I uh, have trouble locating it, but it, it's substandard. What I mean by that is the typical standard zoning line. Oh, I, I know what you it. mean by it. I just want to go, you, you open the book and I want to read it now. Uh, I trust me. I'm, I'm, I completely understand your, uh, your question, but unfortunately I cannot locate it. I'd have to pull it up. Um, if you give me a minute, I could probably pull it up. Um, I just don't have it available, Chairman Toya. So I can't mm -hmm. answer your question to, as to whether or not uh, other lots on this particular block are also of similar size. From my past experience on this board, I think they are, but I, I leave it up to you. You're the lawyer. So I just try to get the you know, questions answered. That's all. 
Okay. Um, unfortunately, I, it'll take me a minute to pull up the 80 acre map. I just don't have it available. Okay. That was my one question. I, I'd like to have that answered before I could vote on this matter. So that would be appreciated if you can get it to us by the end of the day. Absolutely. Yeah. And then Sam, I'm hearing that um, all the lots on that plot are the same length around 122. Mm -hmm. Of course, better coming from, from the counselor than me, but. Thank you, Chairman, that, that helps. Yeah, then the question is, is the, uh, the width of the lots. So Mr. Chairman, I do have the 80 acre map up here. Um, boy, it's, it's kind of difficult to read some of these figures, but Some are actually, some are 25, some are 24. That's just, there's no rhyme or reason. I think even in some of the interior, um, it's very strange. So if we. We've got, we've got a tag in from um, Steve Blanziano from the Department of Planning and Development. So um, Steve, go right, go right ahead. Yeah, um, just to answer the question so that uh, uh, Commissioner Toya can can then you know vote on this is that on this block um, the lot depths of every uh, lot in this subdivision is 122.85 feet deep and the predominant lot width in this subdivision again is 24 feet with um, seven lots that are 25 feet wide and 11 watt lots that are 24 feet wide. And again, that repeats then in this subdivision uh, to the north. So um, I would say the predominant lot size, uh, how the department would look at it in any kind of, uh, when we look at the uh, predominant nature of a block, the predominant lot is 24 feet wide by 122.85 feet deep on this block. Great, and thank you, Steve. Because I can't remember if we've gotten into this today, but will you just state your name and address for the record? Uh, I'm sorry, Steve Valenziano, Assistant Zoning Administrator, Department of Planning and Development. And do you swear from the tell the truth in today's proceeding? Yes, I do. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Valenziano, for that clarification. Okay. Any other questions um, from the board? Okay, hey, Mr. Lara, we'll take this under consideration and thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, you. members of the board. Yep, thank you. Okay, we're gonna go right ahead, calendar number 226-21-S and I'll read the Department of Planning and Development's recommendation. The Department of Planning and Development recommends approval of the proposed body art service, body piercing and tattooing. Okay. Oh, Councillor, I can see and I believe I can hear you, so you can go right ahead. Okay, good, thank you. Um, um, my name is Warren Silver, uh, Silver Law Office PC. I represent the applicant Evoke Tattoos, LLC. Um, and uh, I believe, uh, I, I'm not seeing her yet, but you guys can see more than I can. Uh, Brooke Engelhart is one of the uh, owners and managers of this LLC, uh, the other being Marcy Mundo. And, and Brooke is joining us and may be I, on, I hope. Um, as is uh, our expert witness, uh, Kareem Musawir, uh, a land planner, to address the uh, special use uh, criteria. Um, uh, the special use that the applicant is seeking uh, is to operate uh, a body art 
services business in a B3 district. This is B3-2. Um, and uh, it's uh, on uh, 5400 North Clark in uh, a Chicago landmark known as the Swedish American Bank Building. Uh, but uh, what may be better known to people is uh, the place where Hamburger Mary's was until last fall. Um, the owner of the property who's consented to this special use um, is seeking to repopulate this building uh, in uh, a vibrant uh, Andersonville business district along Clark Street. Um, and uh, the nature of the businesses in the area uh, will be very well complemented by um, uh, this business. Uh, uh, Brooke and Marcy uh, have been uh, in the body art businesses uh, for, uh, I think, 26 years between the two of them. Um, and they're moving their business from uh, a little further south uh, and west uh, up into Andersonville. They're excited and uh, the neighborhood is excited as well. Uh, we submitted uh, letters of support from the Andersonville Chamber of Commerce and from West Andersonville neighbors together, uh, which is known as WANT. Um, we also uh, were in touch with uh, Alderman Vasquez, uh, and we also notified uh, Alderman uh, Ostrom's office. His uh, ward is right across Clark Street. Um, and uh, uh, they were uh, just fine with this application as well. Um, and uh, is uh, is Brooke been able to join the call? I see. I see Brooke's name. Then. Yeah, I'm here. Great. Okay. Um, great. So, can you uh, please state your name and your current address for the record? Yes, my name is Brooke Inglehart, and our current address is 2222 West Chicago Avenue. Chicago. Okay. And and, and that's, that's the current address. I'm sorry. That's the current address of the applicant, uh, uh, Evoke Tuz LLC. Is that correct? Correct. And uh, do you, you swear, are, in, Counselor? I'm going to swear her in. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Do you, do you, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'll just ask you uh, if you were to testify to the matters that you just testified to as well, knowing that you are now under oath, would you testify the same? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and then to proceed, um, uh, you've, uh, uh, the, the address that you gave is the business address of the applicant uh, Evoke Tattoos LLC. You are uh, the owner of uh, that LLC, is that correct? Correct, yes. Um, and are you the only owner or there's another owner? I'm the co-owner, also Marcy. Okay. And are there any other owners? No. And you and Marcy Mundo are the only managers with full control over that business, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, and you've had substantial experience in this business? Yes. Yes. And uh, you've submitted a proposed floor plan uh, that we filed with the board uh, uh, that uh, outlines how the business will lay out on the second floor of the Swedish American State Bank building. Is that correct? And it's, yeah. it's on the screen now, is that your floor plan? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, uh, no further questions for Ms. Engelhardt at this time. Great. And, and Ms. Englehart, I actually uh, would love to hear from you just about the community communication you had. It's a, I know it's a very popular corner, so I'm sure you had a lot of community interaction. So if you could go a little bit more in depth on that. Just as your one clarification for like kind of how we got into visiting, like going up to Andersonville? More so, um, I know you have the support of a few community groups. So wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that support, who you reached out to, neighbors, et cetera. So, so our main connection is through the, um, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, David Oaks. 
Um, he was the one that reached out to us initially about our business, mentioning that Andersonville was seeking a tattoo and piercing studio um, eventually in the neighborhood. And over the past, you know, couple of years, then we've been, you know, pretty much going to the regular like chamber meetings whenever we can attend them, um, pre-pandemic stuff, of course. And yeah, that's been our main connection. Okay, great. Um, other questions from the board? Or else, Councillor, you can go ahead and, and um, get Kareem on and we okay. might have some more questions. I'm gonna call our uh, expert, Kareem Lusseau here. Kareem, are you on the call? I am. Oh, great, okay. And Councillor Kareem is both and recognized. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so Kareem, you've uh, prepared uh, a report um, that uh, has been submitted to the Zoning Board of Appeals um, that addresses the criteria for granting of a special use, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, um, so you were familiar with the proposed uh, uh, business, you're familiar with the uh, property and the surrounding area, is that correct? It is, yes. Okay, and it was your conclusion uh, if I recall that the standards of the zoning ordinance uh, for a special use have been met? Yes. And the details of that have been submitted in the report uh, that yes. was submitted to the board? Yes, sir. Okay, and then um, I wanna ask both witnesses, um, uh, there were, uh, were affidavits prepared for each of you. Um, if you were to uh, be asked the questions about the matters appearing in those affidavits that have been submitted to the board, would you testify the same at this time? I'll let Brooke go first. Um, Kareem? I would, yes. And Brooke, would you testify to the contents of your affidavit as well? Yes. And then Kareem, uh, you've reviewed the findings of fact. Um, and uh, you uh, concur with the uh, facts as presented in the proposed findings of fact, based on your expert uh, knowledge? Yes, sir. And uh, Brooke, you are uh, with the findings of fact, uh, as I set them forth, particularly as they relate to you uh, and Marcy and your experience and the business's experience. Correct. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, no further questions for our witnesses at this time. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if the board has any questions. Yeah, does any other questions from the board? Okay, I'm hearing none. So it sounds like we have everything we need. Uh, thank you, Ms. Englehart, so much for coming in today. And um, we'll take this under consideration. Okay, thank, thank you. Mr. Yep. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna take one more, which is actually a series of cases before we take a break. Um, so next up, we have 227, 228, 229, and 230, 21Z. And these are at 1909 North Levitt. Okay, um, may I proceed? Okay, okay, again, for the record, uh, Warren Silver, Silver Law Office PC. Um, we are representing uh, in this matter, uh, these matters, uh, 1909 uh, North Levitt LLC. Um, uh, its members are Ash Desai and Kara Desai who are married to each other. Um, they are the only members, the only managers um, and uh, uh, their architect, Tom Lee of Eastman Lee Architects, uh, is, is here uh, today as well. Um, the current zoning district is RS3, uh, and the current property is currently uh, got a, a three-story brick residential building uh, that's currently vacant. Um, and uh, uh, in this instance, um, um, Ash is... Uh, a construction uh, professional by trade um, and uh, a developer, uh, but uh, that's not the hat he's wearing here. Um, it may look unusual for it to be in an LLC, but this is his business. Uh, but the ultimate goal is to uh, construct uh, the residence for 
uh, his family uh, to move into and for him to, to raise his family in this neighborhood. Um, because it's uh, an existing non-conforming building that needs some TLC, um, uh, variations are required in order to uh, reconstruct the deteriorated uh, and non-conforming dormers. Um, and uh, that involves in increasing the floor area ratio uh, by uh, not more than 15%. Um, uh, the current floor area being 2,349 square feet and increasing by uh, 275 square feet, uh, which is uh, uh, roughly 11 and three quarters percent. Uh, the height would increase slightly from 30 to 31.16 feet. The uh, north and south side setbacks would need to be uh, adjusted to zero because uh, the existing concrete patio does not match the elevation of the entrance at the rear of the property. So uh, it will be necessary uh, since some of that concrete patio uh, extends to the uh, side lot lines within the side yards, um, uh, that construction requires a variation. And then also uh, the uh, rear yard open space uh, because uh, the lot is uh, substantially shorter than a, a normal city lot. It's 100 feet deep and the property is 24 feet wide. Uh, getting property that is 15 feet on all sides in the rear yard uh, while maintaining a garage um, for the required parking um, is uh, not uh, practical and so uh, relocation of the rear yard uh, open space to the um, uh, roof of the garage is, is being requested. Uh, those uh, hardships uh, are why we are seeking the variations because of the non-conforming nature of the portions of the building that need uh, reconstruction uh, and uh, uh, because uh, the lot depth is uh, so substantially short. And uh, while the block was laid out that way, um, uh, it's not generally applicable to properties of, uh, in the RS3 district. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, at this time, um, I also want to mention that um, we forwarded the plans to um, Alderman Wegespec's office. Um, and we also uh, sent the, the required notice out to uh, all the uh, adjacent property owners uh, uh, up to 100 feet out as required. Um, and uh, we received uh, actually a, a positive call and, and no negative calls. And uh, we have not heard of any objections from, uh, from the aldermen as well. Um, uh, at this time, I'd like to call um, Ash Desai, our, um, you on the call, Ash? Um, I, I oh, do. I'm sorry. Yes, I am. There's Ash. Oh, there he is. Great. Yeah, sorry about that. All right. No, terrific. Thanks. Um, so, can you please state your name and your current address for the record? Sure. Ash Desai, um, current address is 2030 West Rice Street, uh, Chicago, Illinois, 60622. Okay. Thank and you. And, and Ash, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? I do. Thank you. And uh, if you would please, um, what's your occupation? Yeah, um, I'm in, I've been in the construction industry for about 20 years. Okay. Uh, you're a, a general contractor? Or a yeah, I'm a, a, I own a commercial general contracting company. Okay. And so you're familiar with development projects like this, right? Yes. And in fact, you um, uh, make your money doing development projects like this. Is that correct? Yeah, mo we do some development. Most of our work is co contracting work for other building owners. But, yeah. but now, is that uh, the case uh, for this property? No. So, uh, you know, my wife and I, uh, when we were dating, uh, we lived in the neighborhood from 2009 to 2013. And uh, we moved out of there um, and bought a place in Ukrainian Village or Worker Park in the Ukrainian Village. And we always loved the neighborhood. And 
we've seen this building before. Um, you know, it's an older kind of not well kept, but an older property. We like the facade and it came on the market in September and, or I'm sorry, in August. And uh, we decided to buy it with the intent that we would renovate it and convert it to our single family home. Okay. So there's no profit motive in here whatsoever. No. Correct. Okay. And uh, the, uh, the plan is to keep the building there and, and, and to maintain its place uh, contributing to the character of the neighborhood rather than to uh, just use the land to put something else up. Is that correct? Yeah, correct. Um, when we bought the house, uh, it was rented um, by the previous owners, who I believe owned it for about 40 years in a family. Um, it's barely in rentable condition right now. There's a lot of leaks and hasn't been really well maintained. Um, we let the tenants um, extra extend the end of their leases while we did design. Um, but it is our intent, we'd rather keep the house and the guts of what's there than tear it down and start from new. We really like the way it looks. Okay, um, thank you. And then um, uh, you've reviewed the findings of fact uh, that I submitted, uh, the proposed findings of fact that I submitted for the board's consideration. And you have also uh, reviewed uh, the affidavit that uh, I prepared after consultation with you that we've yes. submitted to the, to the Zoning Board of Appeals? Okay. If I were to uh, ask you about all the different matters set forth in that affidavit, you would testify the same? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Um, and then can you talk a bit about your outreach to the neighbors uh, regarding the, this project? Yes, so um, we've spoken to, you know, um, we have not moved in there um, because it was rented to other tenants, but we've spoken with both of our immediate neighbors uh, to the north and to the south, and we walked them through our plans. Um, they were both very supportive of it because we are removing um, an existing three-story uh, enclosed porch that is in pretty bad shape. Um, and the dormers that uh, 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 Warren mentioned, um, those exist today, but they're framed irregularly and they're rotted. So our intent is actually to um, restore them and frame them so they match each other because right now one is a little bit different than the other. So both the neighbors were supportive to have a family next door instead of three transient neighbors as the neighborhood is predominantly single family and has been since we lived there back in 2009. Um, uh, additionally, uh, around the corner, um, uh, a couple of people that I know uh, personally and professionally live over there. I've spoken to them and they're in support of, of the uh, um, project as well in terms of what we were doing there. Okay, thank you. Um, no further questions um, for Ash. Um, uh, I, if the board wants to ask questions or I can call the architect. Um, I'm gonna have a couple questions, but let's call the architect and then we'll okay. board. Okay, uh, Tom, are you on the call? I am. Okay, terrific. Please uh, state your name and your address for the record. Uh, my name is Tom Lee, a licensed architect in the state of Illinois. Um, and I reside at 3730 North Lakeshore Drive, Chicago, 60613. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Lee. And do you swear firmly tell the truth in today's proceeding? Yes. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, and uh, have you appeared before this board before, or do you want to uh, talk a bit more about your qualifications as an architect? Um, I have not appeared before the board. Um, I am. Uh, I have about twenty years of experience. Uh, recently started my own practice, but was previously a design director at um, a firm called HDR um, and any number of other uh, firms here in the city um, and on the East Coast. So. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I, I want to ask you, uh, you know, we spoke uh, uh, briefly about some of the challenges of uh, rehabilitating uh, a nonconforming building like this uh, uh, and, and the hardships of doing so within the confines of the zoning ordinance. Um, can you please elaborate uh, briefly on uh, the rehab project uh, as a whole and then in particular, the hardships involved that require the variations? Sure, I'll try to be brief, but I would say that the 
because of the compact site, I mean, the, as you can see in the drawings, the, the property is made up of several parts from west to east. It's a three-story uh, gable roof structure that includes these two dormers that we, uh, Ash had mentioned. Um, they are in need of repair. Um, and as he mentioned, that we are going to look to reframe the south dormer to match the north so it'll restore a sort of symmetrical appearance from the street side. Um, we're going to restore the front of the facade and maintain the sort of uh, really beautiful brick detail. It's probably one of the few houses on the block that have that kind of detail. So it was really important to Karen Osh that they um, still maintain that sort of facade for the community. And then on the rear side, that's when all this starts to come together. Um, so uh, there was a there's a two-story masonry addition, and if you look at the drawing there, you can see it off to, to the left there. Um, that is uh, adjoining the existing gable roof house, and then off to that, uh, to the east of that, um, is that three-story enclosed porch that Ash was talking about, and then to the east of that is the one-car garage. Uh, given the 100-foot site that's packing a lot of stuff into a very limited um, area, and so when you start, we take down the one-car garage and put a properly sized two-car garage there, um, to offset two feet from the alley. Um, and we, uh, we can eliminate that enclosed porch. Uh, we end up with uh, about, just the way the math works out, about 12 feet or thereabouts clear um, in that rear yard, which is why we're seeking the variance to move it to the, to the garage up above, uh, or that rear yard to the garage up above. And I don't know if it's possible to cycle to the site plan uh, at all, um, but you'll notice that we've added, we've tried to be very sensitive with um, um, what we were doing with the property. The, the house is very intimately scaled, um, is a polite way to put it. The rooms are not overly generous. Um, and so what you'll see in the site plan is uh, right there, um, this uh, sort of gray toned area, it's this L-shaped uh, to the south of that uh, masonry addition, um, a sort of carefully calibrated addition that um, brings the south wall of that addition down about 15 inches, just to give a little bit more space in that room. Um, and then you can see the sort of square part of the addition is a mudroom um, addition, um, which we tried to align more or less to the house to the south so that we minimize any real visual impact uh, for this square footage that we're restoring uh, to any other neighbor. So hopefully they don't really notice much of a difference. Um, that area um, where the, let's say the side yard gets wider um, in, within that addition is what uh, Warren was referring to where the that current concrete patio sits below grade and slopes back towards the house. And so what we'd like to do is elevate that about seven or eight inches to restore it back to grade and to sort of flush that out so we can drain that area properly. Um, it occurs in the side yard um, technically. So um, I think that that speaks to that side yard setback. Um, but other than that, uh, the, the goal is to try to minimize our impact and improve the condition in the neighborhood by eliminating that existing three-story closed porch. I apologize. This is the court reporter. Uh, I got, there was some background. Neighborhood by eliminating. Uh, the three-story enclosed porch. Okay. Um, uh, so, uh, Tom, I uh, want to ask if you had reviewed the findings of fact that we had prepared for uh, submittal uh, to the board uh, for consideration. Yes. And you reviewed the affidavit that we prepared uh, in consultation with you uh, that we've submitted yes. to the zoning board. Uh, and yes. uh, if you were to testify further, you'd testify consistently with the affidavit and with the findings of fact. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Thank you very much. No further questions. Um, does uh, the board, any of the commissioners have any questions? And thank you, everyone, um, for your summary. So, um, very like simplified summary of this, and let me know if I'm, I'm missing it. A lot of the um, changes to the building, from a very standpoint, are just getting things into conformity. A lot of the main building issues are just legal non-conforming, and the additional to a new garage. Is that correct, or is there any actual building outwards? For the main building, because counselors sometimes the variances, I couldn't count. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I'm sorry, Commissioner, but uh, Mr. Chairman, you were cutting in and out, so I didn't hear the whole question. But I think what you asked was uh, whether uh, the purpose was 
to make things bigger or just to restore non-conforming elements uh, the, that are already there. Um, and uh, I, I think I'll let Tom elaborate on that a, a bit, but uh, you know, essentially, um, you know, it's not necessarily exactly, uh, you know, anytime you do something like this, um, uh, you know, the dimensions may vary a bit here and there. Um, you know, Ash mentioned that uh, one of the things they're doing is making the dormers uh, match each other a little bit better than they had. Uh, so I don't think it would be accurate to say everything's exactly the same size as it was before. But I think the spirit of the design is that. And Tom, if you want to add anything to that. And, and I'll clarify too before Tom gets back. Um, for example, I just want to And can you mute if you're not currently speaking? Because we're all, there's some feedback on some of um, Okay. Um, let's see if, if this works. Yeah, counselor. So for example, when you describe the, the height increase, how I view it is that's just getting the building into conformity and the wording and how you said it. I just wanted to clarify because it sounded like you were saying the height was going to grow on the building. I just want to confirm with that in specific that we're not changing the height of this building. We're getting the variation in, into conformity. Okay, so uh, the dormers currently are non-conforming as to height. And so the 30 feet that we mentioned is the height limit in the zoning ordinance for this zoning district RS3. Um, now, uh, Tom, if you want to elaborate on the precise heights of the dormers as existing and as proposed, um, maybe that would clarify it. Sure. So the the South Dormer dictates in terms of the current height. So I think it's like 31 feet and two inches and some change in that, in that area. Um, once we restore it to match the North Dormer, the height I think decreases like an inch or so, so that it matches the, the elevation of the North Dormer roof. Um, so it's like 31 feet, one in some change as well. So um, in a nutshell, yes, it, it, it's meant to really uh, bring the nonconformity into compliance. Okay, uh, uh, Chairman. Just, yeah, go ahead. Uh, if you don't mind, um, just to clarify, the the ex we are not raising the height of the building. The existing South right. Dormer is above the thirty foot set, um, thirty one foot, a little bit over thirty one. We are bringing the North Dormer to. I'm sorry, other way around. We are bringing up the uh, South Dormer to match the height of the North Dormer and to bring it into code. Yeah, thank you, Josh. And I knew you were. I just wanted to clarify it on the record. Yeah, something that was said was confusing. Correct. Uh, and just to clarify one other thing that the rear porch is coming off. Uh, when that comes off, there's that small addition that Tom had mentioned that's coming in. Um, the square footages are based on um, the square footage once that porch comes out. So we're actually reducing the footprint of square footage on the property site on the net basis. Yep. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Um, questions from the board. Okay, thank you everyone. We're, we're gonna take this under consideration. All right, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Yep, yep. Thank, thank you so much, bye. Very much and look okay. forward to the time we can all be together again. Yeah, me, me too, Warren, thank you. Um, all right, great. I'm gonna call a 15 minute recess. Um, that will bring us back at 3.55 p.m. Central Standard Time. Um, so Commissioner Toya seconds, Commissioner Saul. Yes. Commissioner Sanchez. Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes. We'll reconvene at 3.55 p.m. Central Standard Time. Thank you. Hi, James. I'm good. How are you? Hey, Zurich, real quick. You're um, not muted. Just heads up.
Um, Mr. Chairman, this is the court reporter. Um, it seems like my video is disabled. I just wanted to check that. Oh, oh there we go. Uh, there okay. we go. I can see Thank you. you. For sure. One minute, everyone. Okay. Move that we reconvene today's meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Salt? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes. We're back for the, the final little push. Uh, so we're going to call up the last regular calendar number. It's number 232-21-Z. And this will be Councilor Barnes. Councilor, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Good afternoon once more, Mr. Chairman and esteemed members of the board. For the record, again, my name is Sarah Barnes and I'm an attorney with the losses of Sam Banks located at 221 North LaSalle Street. I am happy to be here this afternoon on behalf of the applicant 2338 West Dickens LLC. Here with us today virtually are um, the managing members of the uh, applicant LLC and brothers, um, Vince and Frank Ramos. As well, we have our project um, design professional, Michael Cox. And I just want to be sure that they all made it onto the call. So if everybody can chime in and we can get you sworn in as well. Um, Frank, and or Vince, are you, are you on? I'm here, Frank. Okay, perfect. And then- and Vince is trying to get promoted right now. Okay. And is Michael Cox, did he make it in and on? He's trying to get promoted as well, so yeah. Oh, okay. Do you um, wanna swear in on Frank Ramos, Mr. Yeah, Taylor? I'm yeah, I can get started. And I'll note too, we have an objector on this matter um, so that everyone knows how this goes. Um, the applicant will put on their case in chief. Um, the board will ask initial questions from the applicant. Then we'll move over to the objector. The objector will give their objection. Um, in doing so, they can ask questions of the applicant and vice versa. Um, the board will ask questions the whole time and then we'll return to the applicant for a closing. Um, so with that, um, Frank, can you please figure in the address? Frank Ramos, 1166 McCormick Street, Carroll Stream, Illinois, 60188. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? I do. Thank you. All right, next, I, I believe, um, Vince, did you get promoted? I think so. Can you guys hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Yeah, Vince, can you state your name and address? Vince Ramos, 1166 McCormick Street, Carroll Street, Illinois, 60188. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? I do. Okay. Um, and then finally, uh, Mr. Michael Cox, um, you please state your address. Uh, yes, Michael Cox, 120 West Madison in Chicago. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? I do. Okay, thank you. Go right ahead, Counselor. Thank you so much um, once more, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Um, before I begin with our direct uh, presentation, um, earlier this week, we were advised that one of the adjacent property owners, Mr. Joseph Darnell, who I believe is joining us today, had some questions and concerns about the subject application. Um, accordingly, Mr. Ramos reached out to Mr. Darnell to discuss this matter. 
As a result of these ongoing communications, we were able to make some modifications to the programming for the proposed new garage to the satisfaction, or I believe to the satisfaction of Mr. Darnell. Generally speaking, we flip, flipped the footprint of the garage. Um, and I don't know, Ms. Vazquez, if you can advance the slides to the site. There you go. Um, okay, so with the original application, the garage had been situated along the west side of the property. This diagram that you see um, on the screen right now shows it flipped to the east side of the property. Um, and again, that was a revision and a modification that was made based on our ongoing, um, based on Mr. Ramos's uh, communications and discussions with Mr. Darnell, the neighbor. Um, he owns the property that's actually to the west of the subject site. As well, um, further accommodations were made with regard to the standalone, the independent stair structure that provides access to the proposed roof deck above the garage. Um, again, pursuant to the original application, that stair had been located along the back end of the garage between the principal building and the garage. Again, once more, pursuant to our communications and dialogue with Mr. Darnell, we relocated that independent stair structure so that it's now parallel to the west wall of the proposed new three-car garage. Um, and as I believe Mr. Chairman so eloquently put it um, earlier in these proceedings, that is a Hopkins stair. So um, it does not trigger any relief from this board. It's actually just the garage structure itself that requires the single variation we are seeking here today. Um, so with those changes, which again are reflected on the slide above, um, those we tendered a I tendered a copy of those modified plans to the board. I believe it was yesterday because again, we just had began discussions um, with Mr. Darnell on Wednesday. So I do respectfully request that these, um, these revised plans be incorporated into today's record of proceedings and that any decisions made here today um, be based on the modified set of plans. And Mr. Chairman, I did notice after tendering this copy to the board that unfortunately there is not a date specific um, identified on these plans that account for the date that they were modified. Um, so I'm not sure if that's something that you that your staff can note. Um, otherwise, I'd be happy to supplement the record after the proceedings and get a fresh copy from the architect with a new date on them. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that a supplement should be fine. Let me confirm on the process um, really quickly, counselor, because I do not pretend to be the expert on process. <laughs> I just um, don't want the, um, to mess up corporation counsel with the resolution. Yeah, you know, maybe maybe someone on our staff can date them now. Okay, you can get you can find out and get back to me. I don't want to hold up the proceedings. Um, yep. Carry on. So along these same lines, I do want to advise the board that the modifications that were made do not alter the variation that we are requesting. It doesn't expand the type of relief we need. It actually mitigates the conditions for the relief just a bit. Um, and again, that relief is we're asking for a reduction in the required amount of rear yard open space. Similar to another case you heard earlier today, however, um, we are actually far exceeding the amount of grade level open space for the property by over well over 150 square feet. But unfortunately, due to the footprint of the structures, um, we are on and the substandard depth of the lot, we are unable to provide the contiguous amount of rear yard open space that accounts towards the total. So as a result, we have to ask ask for a reduction in the total amount. Um, and I'll delve into that a little deeper in my presentation, but I just wanted to 
reassure you that this does not modify the or alter the relief that we're seeking. So unless there's any questions about the modifications on, um, and I believe, again, I believe this is to the satisfaction and hopefully resolves the concerns that Mr. Darnell has, but since he is present here today, we can absolutely allow for him to attest to that. Um, so with no further ado, I will um, proceed. Oh, and along these same lines, in addition to Mr. Darnell, um, Mr. Ramos actually went up and down the block for the last several months, kind of talking to some of the other residents who live in the neighborhood. Um, and as a result of those ongoing communications, prior to the proceeding, we actually tendered 12 or nine letters of support um, to the board from residents who live on this block and the block directly behind us. So those, again, were submitted to the board as applicant supplemental exhibit D. Um, getting back to the facts, uh, as a matter of quick but relevant history and background, the applicant owns the subject property, which consists of a single zoning lot that measures 36 feet in width by a mere 100 feet in depth making it significantly substandard in depth at 25 feet shorter than a standard lot. Just over one year ago, the applicant sat down with its design team to create programming for the redevelopment of the subject property that would be consistent with the other existing improvements on the block, almost all of which are three-story and two-story multi-unit residential buildings. And again, all of which which have detached garages. In doing so, the applicant and its design team had to take special consideration of the substandard depth of the lot to ensure that the building was not only functional, but that it also conformed to the bulk standards and requirements of the current zoning ordinance and the corresponding provisions of the building code, while too embracing the character of the other improvements on the block and mitigating any interference with the adjacent properties. As a result of those design meetings, the applicant created a three-story, three-unit residential building of standard size on a significantly substandard depth lot, the design for which such building satisfied all of the bulk standards and requirements of the relevant ordinances and codes, including with regard to its footprint, so it's front, rear, and side setbacks, and it's envelopes, so the height and FAR, as well as its density. Towards these same ends, in order to comply with all the situs requirements, the applicant had to set back the building over 10 feet at the front just, and just under four feet on both of the sides. As well, there is a 30-foot rear setback, resulting in a building that's just about 60 feet in length which is actually slightly shorter than a standard multi-unit residential building. And again, that's due to the substandard depth of the lot. To make up for this deficiency, the applicant was able to reconfigure the layout for each of the units to make use of the extra width of the lot while still maintaining the requisite setbacks. This design, again, resulted in a standard size building on a substandard um, depth lot. In further consideration and compliance of the relevant codes, the applicant had to include a secondary means of ingress and egress for each one of the units, which such requirement cannot be waived by any of the administrative processes. As such, the building also features a narrow three-story open stair structure that runs down the rear elevation of the building. In an effort to further mitigate any perceived optical appearance of these sometimes unsightly yet mandatory structures, the applicant reduced the scaling so that unlike most such structures that run the entire height and width of the building, the secondary stair is situated towards the east portion of the rear elevation. And again, that can be seen on the site plan. Um, with these standard and mandatory principal improvements occupying a good portion of this substandard depth property, the applicant was left with a limited area in which to provide its required off-street parking for each of the units. As such, in light of these limitations, 
And although every single building but for one on this same block has a fully enclosed parking structure, the applicant decide, decided to initially forgo a garage and to instead provide surface parking for each of the units. Accordingly, soon thereafter, the applicant obtained permits and completed construction of a three-story, three-unit residential building with a concrete parking pad. Market dictated that the new units be sold as condominiums rather than rented. As such, upon completing construction of the new building, the applicant's real estate team began marketing the units. Unfortunately, after a few months of active marketing, it became clear that these units would not make it to closing without a deeded garage parking space. To it, the applicant had several very interested buyers walk away as soon as they learned that there was no garage, and that was even with an appropriate price reduction. Therefore, the applicant went back to its design team with the intent to permit a standard detached three-car garage that could service the existing building, just like almost every other building on this block and in the neighborhood. Accordingly, the applicant's design team submit, submitted an application to permit the construction of a standard sized one story detached garage at the rear of the subject site, pursuant to the same plans that provide the basis of this variation as revised. Unfortunately, due to certain re recent changes in interpretation and application of the city's zoning ordinance, it is not simply difficult, but it is actually impossible to permit a standard detached garage on this substandard depth lot without requiring some form of relief, in particular with regard to the rear yard open space. And that is because now the city requires that all residentially zoned properties and improvements maintain at least one segment of contiguous 12 feet by 12 be permeable open space at grade level at the rear of the site. So 144 square feet of contiguous uninterrupted on open space. So that here the applicant must have that 144 square feet patch of uninterrupted open space along or between the garage and the principal building in order to satisfy the total open space requirements of the current zoning ordinance. This is true even if, as we see here, you still meet and exceed uh, the total um, amount of required rear yard open space. Uh, for example, for this site, as I indicated, the applicant is required to maintain 234 square feet of rear yard open space. In actuality, even with the proposed garage and the modifications made to its configuration and orientation, the applicant will be providing approximately 340 square feet of rear yard open space at grade level. It is impossible, however, due to the code compliant footprint of the existing principal building on this substandard depth lot, in conjunction with the footprint of the standard size detached garage to maintain at least one 12 feet by 12 feet contiguous patch of rear yard open space at grade level. In fact, in an effort to ease the demanding agenda of this honorable board, the applicant and its design team spent many weeks, many, many weeks, trust me, at the drawing table looking at every possible alternative, including without limitation, reor reorienting the garage in a multitude of configurations, sacrificing one enclosed parking space and providing a two car garage plus a single surface parking place and even the possibility of a carport. Unfortunately, every single one of these design alternative necess necessitates a petition to this board, which humbly brings us here today um, for this alternative. Um, before I continue, Mr. Chairman, with the witnesses and for, again, the um, consideration of Corporation Council in drafting any resolution, the general descriptive statement um, in the variation application as written references a roof deck above the proposed detached garage, which will be accessible again, as I uh, indicated before, via an independent stair structure 
that pursuant to the revised plans will now run parallel to the west side wall of the proposed garage. Pursuant to the zoning ordinance, unenclosed stairs providing access to a roof deck on an accessory building with a staircase width not exceeding four feet, just as the one we have here, um, are an allowed encroachment in the required rear setbacks. So again, the stair structure and the roof deck um, don't require, are not the um, basis of this variation. Again, the, the variation is required solely to permit the construction of the three car garage. Um, so with that, <laughs> unless anybody has any questions regarding anything I kind of just described, um, I'm happy to get my witnesses on. Go ahead, Councilor, get your witnesses on. Okay. Um, Mr. Ramos? Yes. May you please state your name and address for the record? Frank Ramos, 1166 McCormick, Carroll Street. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Ramos, aside from being the managing member of the applicant, you're the project manager for um, this proposal. Is that right? Yes. And you um, have been building prop or building residential properties throughout um, the city of Chicago for several years. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and as I described, when you initially went to permit this building in order to hopefully not have to petition this board and take up their time, you decided to proceed with the three unit building with a surface parking pad, is that true? Correct. Um, and that is in fact what you permitted and um, constructed, is that right? Yes. And um, you have retained a team of licensed real estate brokers and agents who market your properties, is that right? Yes. And upon completion of these improvements, you sent them out into the market and had them start uh, trying to sell the three, three units, is that correct? Yes. And they spent several months doing this, is that right? Yes. Um, and as a result of those many months of um, marketing, did uh, is it true that you did not have any buyers that actually went to contract? Correct. And that's because um, there was no enclosed parking for the units. Is that true? Yes. Um, and getting back to kind of that market analysis, so once it became pretty clear that deeded parking was deeded enclosed parking was not just a desire in this neighborhood, but it was actually a demand. Um, your brokers did some some more research on the MLS, is that right? Yes. Um, and based on that research, which was conducted based on sales over the last 24 months, um, is it true that there was not one new construction condominium, so owner-occupied unit that sold in this same neighborhood that did not have some type of enclosed parking? Correct. And it's since the existence of the MLS, they have not found one. Thank you so much. So that's what brought you back to the table with your design team to come up with um, a plan for the permitting of a new garage. Is that right? Yes. And again, um, I know because I was a part of a lot of this, um, you spent a couple months um, with your design team alone just trying to come up with any type of structure that would enable the enclosed parking, but that would not require any form of relief. Is that true? Correct. And as I kind of indicated, we looked at carports, you looked at reorienting um, the situation of the garage on the site, and even at mixing up maybe some surface parking and a garage structure. Is that all right? Correct. Um, and all of the structures uh, required a variation, including the carport, would require a variation from the board because those are considered um, an un unallowable encroachment in the rear yard open space. Is that right? Yes. 
Um, and even to if we did one surface parking spot and a two car garage that too interferes with the um, contiguous rear yard open space. Is that right? Yes. Okay, so um, you did a survey of the existing improvements on this particular block of Dickens and on Ch Charleston Street um, behind us, both of which streets have similar lot conditions as yours, meaning they're shorter. Um, and based on that survey, it was, um, you observed that the most consistent improvement was just the standard one story garage, detached garage for each unit that was um, in the corresponding principal building. Is that true? Yes. So you had your design team um, come up with a plan for the permitting of that type of structure. Is that right? Correct. Um, and in our ongoing research in this regard, is it true that we actually filed a Freedom of Information Act request because there were two other, at least two other properties on this same block of Dickens that were construct with, constructed with almost identical improvements over the last couple of years? Correct. And based on the results from that FOIA request, um, those principal buildings with the detached garage were permitted without having to come before this board, even though similar to our case, they were unable to satisfy the contiguous rear yard open space requirement. Is that right? Yes. Thank you. Um, so you were being proactive in petitioning the board for the relief required to permit this garage. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Um, with that, for right now, Mr. Ramos, I don't have any other questions. However, um, we did prepare pretty considerable findings of fact as well. You um, were given an affidavit prior to this hearing that you executed. If you were to continue to testify here today, would your testimony be consistent with the statements made in those documents? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Chairman, if anybody wants to ask questions of Mr. Ramos, we can, or I can proceed with the um, architect. Let's uh, let's proceed with the architect and, and keep it going. Cause I think it'll be good to get to the objector and see what's going on there because yeah. you know, some of this might be necessary. Hopefully nothing now, but um, yes, I agree. So I'm gonna keep it short with Mr. Cox and then we can circle back with him for questions. Um, so Mr. Cox, may you please state once more your name and address for the record? Sure, it's Michael Cox and 120 West Madison in Chicago. Thank you, and Mr. Cox, you are um, a licensed structural engineer here in the state of Illinois, is that right? That's correct. And you've appeared before this board in this capacity on several occasions, is that right? That's correct. Thank you. Um, and as, as has been stated throughout this presentation, you were retained by the um, applicant to not only design the programming for the principal building, but then to, to create the programming for the proposed one-story garage, is that right? Yes. Um, and just to keep it short, since I've kind of already beaten the horse to death, um, you're, you spent many, 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 many hours and days and weeks at the drawing table with Mr. Ramos, um, trying to come up with a, with programming for the proposed garage that would not require any relief. Is that true? That's true. Um, and no matter what we did to flip this upside down, forwards and sideways, um, there were no alternative enclosed parking structures that would not require us to come before this board. Is that right? That's correct. Thank you. Um, Mr. Cox. And with that, prior to the hearing, you two were provided with a copy of the applicant's findings of fact, as well as an affidavit, which you executed. If you were to continue to testify here today, would your testimony be consistent with the statements made in those documents? Yes, it would. And then just sorry for the record real quickly, Mr. Cox. Um, is it your opinion then based on all of the facts put forth herein and the existing conditions that the proposed variation to allow for the construction of the one-story garage 
does in fact meet all of the standards and requirements for a variation as set forth under the current zoning ordinance? Yes. Thank you. I have no further questions for my witnesses at this time. Oops, sorry, I was on mute. Um, okay, so questions from the board before we go over the chapter. I'll, I'll ask a question. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, Mr. Ramos, um, I get that this is a, a short lot at 100 feet, um, but can you talk a little bit about how this is not a self-created hardship? Um, had you made the decision to build a garage before you built the building, you, you know, you perhaps could have built a smaller building so that you could uh, get the garage on the lot? Oh, and, and Mr. Ramos, you can address Commissioner Sanchez as well, but um, we did take a look. That's a great question, Commissioner um, Sanchez. That was actually my first question. Um, and we did take a look at redesigning the principal building um, to make it wider, to make use of the width of the lot, but in doing so and make a shorter um, building, but in doing so it compromises the configuration of the units um, and if and in order to make up for what we would lose in the depth of the building since it's already a shorter building and Mr. Cox can maybe describe this better too we would have to go wider with it and then we're and then we would be back before the board because we'd be seeking um, side yard setback relief uh, which is the case for a lot of actually the buildings on this block um, but perhaps Frank uh, or Mr. Ramos and or Mr. Cox, you can probably articulate that much better than me. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. We would have had to seek relief in the beginning for side setbacks. Um, and at the time, we didn't think that it would be an issue. Um, we did not dig in, we're, we're, we're not brokers, we're not real estate agents. We did not dig into the fact that not one single unit new construction in Bucktown, as long as the MLS has been in existence, has sold without a garage spot. So, Mr. Ramos, if you were to start from scratch with this 36 foot wide by 100 foot deep lot and or Mr. Cox, maybe you're the appropriate person to answer this, but even if we started from scratch, take all of these improvements, would you be able to um, design programming for a three unit principal building and a three car garage on this significantly substandard depth lot without having to seek some form of relief from this board? No. Mr. Cox, is that your opinion since you're the design guru? Yes, that is my opinion. It would, it would, we would have to seek some sort of relief. The, the layouts were very difficult to get to work. And this building is actually shorter already, even in this, um, in this rendering, this building is already shorter than most standard three unit buildings. Is that I right? 13 feet. Yes, that's right. And, and even less square footage. So you would have to take, um, so 13 feet shorter already. If we were to reduce it, we'd have to reduce it another four feet um, to meet the contiguous rear yard setback. So you would have to make up for that on the sides of the building um, or by widening it to make up for the rooms that you would lose. Is that that's right? That's correct. Yep, that's correct. Okay. Commissioner Sanchez, does that address? I I think it I think it does. Uh, I'm a little bit confused, but um, maybe I'll ask just a follow up to see if I'm understanding it correctly. I mean, are, are you are you saying that you couldn't have built a smaller building that would have been marketable along with a garage? Had you had you planned it out differently at the beginning? Correct, because I would have to lose another four feet on the rear, and they are only two bedroom, two bath units, so. I, I, I'll, that's the smallest bed bath count that you could build, period. I wouldn't be able to get, by losing four more feet, I would not be able to get that. 
because it's okay. four feet by the by the width of the building as well. So I would have had to try and pick it up in the width, and it just wouldn't. It doesn't lay out. We try. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions from the board before we um, go to the objector? Okay, let's visit um, Mr. Darnell. Mr. Darnell, are you still on? Let's see. Yes, I'm here. Great, okay, um, can you please say your name and address? Uh, Joe Darnell, 2332 West Palmer, Chicago, 60647. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, Mr. Darn Darnell, so I know you've probably heard, but um, uh, the board has, has heard that there's been some um, amount of compromise with the, um, the new plan. So this is your opportunity to either state your objection, object further, or withdraw your objection. Yeah, I mean, um, with the original layout, we did have uh, objections. Uh, with the new layout, most of those objections have been um, kind of resolved. Um, and I believe that the current open space is uh, much more beneficial to the potential condo owners as well as the neighbors. And so at this point, we have uh, no further objections to the uh, open space issue. Okay, okay, so if I'm hearing you rightly, right, correctly, um, you in a way are withdrawing your objection because you have no further objection, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, um, okay, great. Then unless um, you had anything else, um, we just say thank you for, for taking the time to come out and, and um, talk on this today and compromise. Uh, yes, that's fine, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, thank you. I echo um, my gratitude. I know these are long proceedings, so. Yep. Um, we like when people compromise before getting you. Um, okay, so um, to go back to the applicant, do we have any other questions from the board generally or else I think the counselor can close this out? Okay, counselor, take it away if you just close. Okay, thank you. Um, and just to be clear once more, um, the hardship in this case is the not the decision to bifurcate the relief, but rather, or to bifurcate the permitting of the two structures, but rather the su significantly substandard depth of the lot um, prevent creates a very practical difficulty in creating programming for a viable residential building on this site that's also compatible with the other existing improvements on this um, particular block. I know Commissioner Toya um, likes to know what kind of the makeup of the block is, especially when we rely on the substandard um, lot size argument as our hardship. I do, thank and you, thank you, thank you. Of course, I'm ready. Um, so Commissioner Toya and all other commissioners, um, yes, in uh, on this block of Dickens, all of the properties are 100 feet deep. Um, towards that same end, again, we did some FOIA research and almost all of the existing properties, um, improvements on this block for which there's about 12 properties. Um, all of them have non-conforming conditions with regard to their improvements under the current zoning ordinance as it's applied today. So there could have been a time when they wouldn't have been um, non-conforming. And that goes towards each of, each of the adjacent neighbors. Um, there's not Councilor, enough- Councilor, sorry to cut you off. Um, we don't need a summary. Okay, uh, perfect. We're, we're totally remembering everything previously. <laughs> So, it's, it's all in the findings of fact. So, um, yeah, if you could just close out, that would be wonderful. I, to be honest, we just very respectfully request um, your consideration and approval. Yes, and we will take this under consideration. So, I want to thank everyone for your yeah. time. And, thank, uh, you Karen, so yep, thank you, Karen. Yep, thank you, board members. Yep, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful weekend.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we are now moving into continuances from last month's meeting. The first one we're going to be taking is calendar number 420-20-S. And to start it, I'm going to read the Department of Planning and Development's recommendation um, because if everyone remembers from last month, um, that became a source of question. So everyone just, after, you know, Make sure to listen even more than usual when I read the recommendations. So the Department of Planning and Development recommends approval of the dog boarding kennel and daycare provided that number one, the special use is issued solely to the applicant, Fuzzy Urban Tales, LLC. Number two, the maximum number of dogs being, <clears throat> being cared for at any one time is limited to 25. Number three, each dog is provided with a cage or separate individual enclosure. Number four, the facility has a minimum of three trained staff members on site with a minimum of two trained staff members in constant supervision of the dog, dog playtime group. And number five, the development is consistent with the design and layout of the plans and drawings dated May 19th, 2021 and prepared by Grid Studio, Ramon Contreras Architect. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, yep, thank you, Paul. Oh, my pleasure. Um, again, this was presented prior, so I'm going to kind of run through uh, the uh, my presentation, if you don't mind. Yep, um, and just, just as a note, especially on these two continuances, um, it's a continuance in all sense of the words. So we're not going to re-adjudicate, um, if you will, every single thing. We really wanna just hear about the issues that we continue for. Um, so if your initial summary can focus on those, that can guide our conversation really well because we have a lot of info on this. Okay, I'll do it quickly. Uh, it is late on, on a Friday. Uh, as you're aware, uh, my client is Louis Galago. He is the uh, manager of Fuzzy Urban Tales, LLC. As we mentioned prior to that, my client has lived in the neighborhood approximately 19 years, ran a daycare for children in that neighborhood. Based on that information on the, and the feedback he was getting from his clients, he decided to try to open a dog daycare uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, my client owns the property uh, and he owns the property uh, to the one. east. Um, we started this project back in April of 2020. In July of 2020, we received uh, approval from the Logan Square Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we have a letter of support from the Alderman. Uh, subsequently, uh, we were asked to, uh, re during that time before the application, my client went to the condominium to the west and to the neighbor, uh, not immediately adjacent because he owns that property, but uh, to the east of that property. And everybody was on board with this and actually welcomed with open arms. Uh, we were then asked to, to uh, get something in writing from the neighbors and we did present to this board a uh, petition indicating their support for this use at the site. Uh, we then negotiated with the Department of Planning and the Department of Planning asked us to implement a number of changes which we did uh, essentially the property, uh, as I mentioned, has a first floor. It's gonna be developed uh, should the special use uh, go through for the dog daycare and then floors two and three are residential. Uh, they asked that we separate the dog from the outside via a fence so that if you're exiting the residential property uh, that you would not interact with those dogs, which we did. Uh, the other requirements were uh, to put soundproof fencing and landscaping on the east and west boundary lines of our property, which we incorporated into our plan. Uh, then came the meeting on, uh, in April when the issue of the amount of the dogs uh, came up. And I do want to give a, a uh, to say my, my thanks to uh, Steve Lanziano and Nancy uh, Rizevic, uh, because this is uncharted, there's nothing that guides us here. It's all advisory. Uh, Steve looked at uh, anti-cruelty. We sent him some uh, other 
uh, articles on this, but the city of Chicago has no regulations for the amount of dogs. And I believe that Steve, uh, we were able to work out something that uh, the city could recommend and that we, uh, uh, based on the economic analysis that we sent in for 25 dogs, we feel that that would be sufficient for us to have a, uh, a business at this site. Um, Mr. Galago, are you on? Do you guys hear me now? Yes, Mr. Galago, could you please, Chairman, do you want to swear Mr. Galago in? Yep, uh, Mr. Galago, please state your name and address. Uh, my name is Luis Gallego. Uh, I'm in uh, 2436 North Washington Avenue, Chicago, Illinois, 60647. Great, and do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes. Well, Mr. Gallego, you, if, if this uh, special use is granted, could you state your hours of operation? Uh, we're going to get uh, 7 in the morning to 7 p.m. And that's seven days a week? Monday to Friday. And on, on the weekends? Uh, on, on weekends, we get boarding. OK. Did you hear that, Mr. Chairman? Okay, and you, you've seen the negotiations we've had with the Department of Planning, you've seen the recommendations, and again, uh, you would agree to the limitations that the chairman uh, stipulated uh, as part of the special use, meaning that we're going to uh, impact the, uh, put in place the design that your architect, Mr. Contreras, uh, has drawn here as an exhibit dated May 19th, 2021, that the limitation would be to no more than 25 dogs, that you would have three trained staff members and uh, with two constantly in supervision of the playtime group, That's that you would provide each uh, dog with a cage. Uh, Chairman, there was one other that I did not remember quite candidly what you mentioned. But wh whatever the recommendations of the uh, chairman and this board, you're willing to accept those, is that correct? Yes. I have no further questions from my client. Okay, and Paul, you know, it, if it's helpful for you for the record for me to read the recommendation again and have your client approve, that's fine too. Um, we just want to hear, and it sounds like it sounds like your your applicant agrees. He does. We I, he does. Like I mentioned, we've yeah. we've gone back and forth. This has been going on for many many months, and and the department has worked diligently as well as my client, and we have accepted all of that recommend all those recommendations. Okay, great, great. That um that gets rid of any fears that the board had about us choosing. <laughs> so. <laughs> Let's just open um, open up the room for questions. Any other questions from the board? Okay, I think we're good here. If if um, if council rests, we can just take this under consideration. Well, thank you. If, if you don't want me to uh, have uh, Mr. Wisnicki and Contreras, they did testify prior to the standards. But if, whatever you'd like, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, they testified. I'd like to get them sworn in just for the record, um, no but I do think we need their testimony. Um, so thank you for reminding me of that. So um, Mr. Wisnicki, will you please state your name and address? Hello. Go ahead. Hello, uh, Paul Wisnicki, um, business address 221 North LaSalle, Chicago, Illinois, 38th floor. Thank you. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth um, in today's proceedings? I do, sir. Thank you. Okay, and then uh, Mr. Contreras, um, please state your name and address. Ramon? Ramon, you're just um, currently muted. <sighs> Forgive me, I'm gonna attempt to reach Mr. Hello? Contreras. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, there we go. Hey, Ramon. Yeah. Hey, how you doing? Good. Ramon, could you please state your name and your address? 
Ramon Contreras, 5257 West Manchos, Chicago, Illinois, 60641. You're a licensed architect? Yes, I am. Mr. And Chairman, do you, you want to swear in Mr. Contreras? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes, I do. Great, thank you. Um, thank you. With that, Counselor, I think we're okay on our end, unless you have anything else to add. No, I have nothing else. We're, our case is completed. Great. Well, thank you everyone for the conversations that I know were had in the background. Um, really helpful to us and sounds like, um, you know, potentially the best result. So um, we'll take this under consideration. Thank, thank you. you. Everybody be well, be safe. You thank too. you for your time. Enjoy the weekend. Gary, thank you for getting Paul on. <laughs> be well, everyone. Okay. Um, we are moving to our last matter. And that is calendar number 135-21-S on 1840 North Clark Street. So, Councillor Borstein, let me know when you're present, and I'm going to read um, a bit of instruction. We're, we're here, and I believe our uh, our the part of our team that you need is here as well. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So, um, first, I'm going to read the department's recommendation. Then, I'm going to read some instructions on how we see this going today. So first, the Department of Planning and Development recommends approval to establish a school early, learn, early learning center with up to 200 children and 28 staff, provided that the special use is issued solely to the applicant, Board of Education, City of Chicago, and the development is consistent with the design and layout of the plans and drawings dated December 14, 2020, prepared by Wall and Gomez Architects with proposed loading zoning with proposed loading zoning sketch dated March 26, 2021. Okay, great. Okay, so before we get back into this matter, I want to summarize a little bit where we left off from last month. In doing so, I want to note that today's hearing is a continuance in all senses of the word of last month's extensive hearing and all testimony from last month remains on the record. On that note, we will not be restarting the matter and we will not be hearing repetitive testimony as there is no value to that. Last month, we, we discussed a few things that I wanna quick just run down the chain of summary of. First, Attorney Bor Borstein provided an overview of the special use. Then Ivan Hansen provided an overview of, of the pre-K program and the layout of the proposed special use, including particularly loading procedures. Then Kathy Dart testified as to the impact the special use would have on the welfare of the community. Then Athena Farmakis testified as to the basis of her objections, which are traffic congestion and the playground's interference to the easement rights to the plaza and the alley access. Afterwards, attorney Blonder of the objectors provided statements on the easement issues and the declaratory action in circuit court. His basis of objection were the traffic study methodology and, and teams being drawn to the playground. Then attorney Denbo on the basis of objection um, discussed the special use criteria, traffic congestion and noise, lack of communication with the applicant. And finally, Ed Motto objected on the basis of his objection being on the location, safety, liability, lack of setback for the school, traffic study methodology, property values due to increased traffic, et cetera. Bill Grieve um, for Just, Justin Opti, who's CPS traffic expert, testified as to the traffic study. Then Chief Clay testified as to the sufficiency of parking, drop-off procedures, and recess monitoring. Applicant then provided an overview of the special use and the impact on the community and provided testimony on parking, layout, pickup and drop off procedures and recess monitoring. The objectors then testified as to traffic congestion due to the special use, interference with the easement rights to the plaza, access to the alley, the methodology of the traffic study, the playground being an attractive nuisance for teen, noise, lack of communication from the applicant, safety, liability concerns from the layout, the building's lack of setback, 
and the effect on property values. Finally, we heard from Alderman, Alderwoman Smith. Overall, the matter was continued and we are here today because we did not have the traffic study and evidence. We'd like to remind everyone that if you plan to rely on something, as we note at the beginning of every meeting, we needed an evidence. We now have the traffic study and we also have an analysis of that traffic study prepared by the Hemingway Association's own traffic engineer. So we're gonna open with that. Councillor Borstein first, I'd like you to present your traffic engineer and have him or her give a summary of, of their report and explain their methodology. Then we'll allow the objector, to, the objector to ask questions of the applicant based on their traffic study. Then the object, objector's traffic expert will present their traffic engineer and we will do the same where the applicant can ask questions of that traffic engineer. Throughout this, the board will pose questions and then we will close. So that's an overview on how we see process going with a bit of summary from last meeting. Um, nothing has been forgotten, so there's no reason again to have repetitive testimony. And with that, Councillor, you can take your side's summary of the traffic study. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Again, Scott Borstein um, with the Law Office of Neil and Leroy. Um, so uh, just one matter on procedure, you know, we did, I thought we put on our case last time in terms of our traffic uh, and our consultant was there. W would you rather have the opposition? Cause you know, they're the ones who can, you contested our findings and they asked for time to respond to that. N now they have apparently submitted a, a, a response. So maybe it makes more sense to just have them go and then we can respond to, to their objections. I'm happy to do it either way. We have our traffic expert here about it, just in terms of saving time. Um, thought maybe we could cut cut more to the chase, if you will. Whatever you prefer. No, I appreciate that. So I really want to get everything on traffic out um, because there's just been a lot of discussion on this. Um, so we're going to stick with the way I suggested. And if you if your side wants to condense the summary of the traffic study under that, um, feel free. And as you go, feel free to just say you're done and then we can go to their side, but um, I'd like to stick with this process as stated. Okay, all right. Well then, then I think Justin who should be on here, you can swear him in and he can give a summary. Yep, okay. Uh, Justin Opitz, can you please state your name and address? Yes, hi, my name is Justin Opitz. Um, my address is 3708 North Ashland Avenue in Chicago, Illinois, 60613. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes, I do. Great, thank you very much. Um, so I'm, heard, I'm sure you heard the process mm -hmm. um, and also uh, the counselor's comments. Feel free, please, to give another summary of your traffic study. Sure, yep. So I will give the um, abridged version here. So basically what we did was for our traffic study, uh, we conducted traffic counts in October, 2020 at basically the four intersections surrounding the school, that's Clark and Wisconsin, um, that's Lincoln, Wisconsin and Lincoln Park, and then Lincoln and Wells, as well as Lincoln and Clark. And we conducted those uh, traffic counts in October, 2020. And what we did is compare those numbers that we got in, in 2020 to um, historical traffic count volumes from IDOT, which is the Illinois Department of Transportation. Um, along Clark Street and Lincoln Avenue. Um, and those numbers were from 2019. And from there, we um, are following basically the Chicago Department of Transportation guidelines for adjusting volumes up that were counted during the pandemic um, as we compare them to the historical volumes. So our existing volumes counted in 2020 were adjusted up by about 30% in the morning and 20% in the evening. Um, and then from there, we utilize industry standard for modeling traffic impacts. Um, generally, industry standard is, is considered the um, Institute for Traffic Engineers Trip Generation Manual. They're on their 10th edition now. They've been doing this for decades. Um, and what we did with that was uh, we tested two different land uses for this particular site. Um, we tested a daycare and an elementary school. Um, unfortunately, they, they don't have a pre-K in this manual. And uh, within those two different land uses, we looked at three different trip generating factors. We looked at the square footage of the building, 
the number of potential students and the number of employees or staff that the school would have. Um, and through that, we took the highest possible traffic generating land use and modeled it through the adjacent intersections to ensure that we're uh, testing the maximum impact. Um, we also, sorry, let me take a drink here. We also request the latest five years of crash data from the IDOT um, Bureau of, of Safety and uh, look at that for each intersection to make sure there's, there's, there's no safety concerns. Um, and then we also reviewed as part of the traffic study, the uh, pickup drop off loading plan um, with 10 spaces along Lincoln and four spaces uh, for staging along Wisconsin Street. And you know, based on this, we feel that uh, basically the traffic can be accommodated um, throughout the network and absorbed into the, um, the grid system um, very well. And that'll be about it. Justin, I'm sorry, can you just also give a very brief um, summary of you know how we think our loading is going to work based on your study as well? Because those are really the two issues that sure. the opposition sure. raised. Yeah, okay. So uh, during the morning, um, you know, we're, we're going to have cars who are going to be loading, uh, dropping off on the east side of Lincoln. That is the closest space to the building as compared to Clark. So we can kind of minimize the amount of time where it takes from kids to be getting out of, of the car and getting into the building. Um, based on the numbers uh, shown in our trip generation factors, we don't project any queue to be happening during the morning. Um, during the afternoon, uh, based on the numbers that we're showing, we think there might be a projected queue of about 11 vehicles. And that's based on a three minute um, pickup window for parents in this area. And, we're, and we're, we're getting that data from CPS themselves. They have you know, a myriad of pre-K schools across the city. So you know, they, they know how to run these things. And, and with a three minute pickup window, that projected queue is gonna be about 11 vehicles. So we have 10 spaces of loading on Lincoln with the four staging on Wisconsin. So we feel that that can be accommodated um, um, during that afternoon peak hour without negatively impacting the adjacent intersection operations. Thank you, Justin. And, um, sure. and Councillor, I want to just ask a quick question, because I noticed uh, a couple new names on the um, on your witness list. Is Daniel Schim Schmickler, is he here to talk about um, traffic? I know we have someone from CPS, Evan Smith, who I think might be different from who was on last month. Um, yeah. I'm just yeah. trying to make sure that all the new people get selected. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Right. Evan Smith, um, right, is our representative from CPS. He's the director of capital and planning. Uh, and then Dan is, uh, I was not sure if, if the issue of the play lot and the use of the um, common area was going to be an issue again at this continued, continued hearing. So he is counsel for the owner and really is the most knowledgeable about that issue and the litigation that the condo association is pursuing. And so I thought if questions came up about that issue, he would be the appropriate person to address those. Got it, and thank you. And that, that won't be an issue here because we're just not the correct home for that issue. I, I agree a hundred percent. I'm glad so, to hear it. Thank yeah. you. Well, if someone brings it up later, I'll, I'll um, I, you know, we just won't hear it. Um, so, okay, great. Um, so with that, I think um, we then will go to the objectors to before they present their traffic study, kind of like as a preliminary um, step, ask questions of Justin, kind of where we ended off, to be fair, last meeting on the applicant's traffic study. Um, so with that, I'm wondering if the objector will let me know, do you have one person on your end that is um, going to be leading any type of conversation? It's Steve Blonder. Um, I'll likely be the one to ask some questions. Okay, great. Um, and Councilor Blonder, let me know if, I'm, if my audio is okay. Um, I just heard I might be cutting in and out. So oh, you're fine for us. Feel free to yell at me if, uh, if I'm cutting in and out. So with that, Counselor, um, I'm going to swear you in, and then you can begin those preliminary questions. So can you please state your name and address? Sure. Stephen Blonder. I'm a partner at the law firm of Mutt Shellist. 
191 North Wacker Drive, Chicago, Illinois. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes. Thank you. Okay, Justin, just a few questions for you. Um, when you were doing your analysis, what assumptions did you make or use with respect to what neighborhood the children would be in for the school? Um, that those types of assumptions wouldn't be factored in. We're using the, you know, Institute of Transportation Engineers trip generation manual. So this is, you know, those are national figures that, that they're surveying. So they survey these types of land uses all across the country. Um, so, you know, that factor, you know, wouldn't be included, but we wouldn't expect that that would, would truly affect the results. Well, you wouldn't expect because you're talking about a general average as opposed to a neighborhood such as Lincoln Park, which on the one hand is highly congested, correct? Uh, no, I would not consider Lincoln Park a highly congested neighborhood. In your experiences, Lincoln Park, the Lincoln Park area where the schools proposed, is it comprised of single family homes for the most part or multi-use dwellings? Um, I'm not an expert in terms of all of the residential housing in the area, but I do believe there's a good mix of single family homes and multifamily dwellings in the area. Really? Wouldn't it be more accurate to say that the area has more multifamily dwellings than it does single use occupancy structures? Um, again, I'm, I'm not an expert in, in the kind of dwellings that are around that area. And what assumptions did you make as to where the children would be coming from that would be coming to this particular facility? Uh, so we looked at existing travel patterns and, uh, you know, we kind of modeled our trip generation off those. That's generally considered best practice. Um, and what we did was we did not take um, any discount for potential trips that would be parents walking. Um, we did review census data for this area, and, and what that shows us is that there is a, a sizable amount, a sizable amount, approximately 70% um, of adults in the immediate census tract around the school uh, actually do not drive a car to work. Um, so, you know, these are discounts we, we didn't take to ensure a conservative analysis scenario. Yeah, but in doing using your analysis, you ignored the statements of the public meetings from the Chicago Public Schools that this school was designed to encompass children not primarily from the area, which would mean there would be a higher percentage of people driving. You ignored that in doing your study, didn't you? Uh, no, I don't. I don't believe that's the intention of CPS either. M Mr. Chairman, am, am I allowed to interject at all, or should we just let this continue? Uh, you can interject, Scott. Yeah, well, I mean, so, you know, we, the, the focus of the report, um, you know, encompassed uh, a, the possibility of people coming from outside the neighborhood or inside the neighborhood. And what CPS said, in fact, was that while that may be the beginning of who is enrolled at this particular location, that over time, they expect this to become a neighborhood facility. And so the people would be coming from the neighborhood that, you know, maybe not on day one, but over time, that was what CPS said. And Councillor Blonder, the, the floor is still yours. Oh, thank you. I, I didn't, I wanted to make sure that Mr. Borstein was done um, testifying, so with respect to that. So Justin, just so I'm clear, you made no adjustments in your study for where the students were coming from, the nature of the residential living in the area um, or other factors unique to this school, correct? That is generally not standard practice for traffic studies. I didn't ask you what the standard practice is. I'm saying for this study, you didn't take anything uniquely about this proposed school into consideration, right? The, the only unique thing would be that we didn't take any trip discounts because this is located in such a dense multi-use urban area. Generally, when traffic studies like this are performed, um, you're going to conduct, 
conduct the analysis uh, and you're going to you know, see what the manual tells you that your potential trip uh, generation is. And then you will actually take trips off of that because you're in such a walkable area that it's more than likely that people will be walking or biking to wherever they're going. So um, that that would be, you know, one of the unique factors that we utilize for this study is that we okay. didn't take any discounts. Okay, you're aware that my client, which is the condominium building next to it, is more approximately 280 units, correct? Mm -hmm. At the time that you made your study, and you're aware that there's a driveway for the garage into that building that, and that exits to which if cars are circling or queued up, they'll be in front of that driveway, correct? Correct, but the loading for this is on Lincoln, not on Clark. Okay. My next question to you is, from your analysis in October 2020, what adjustment, if any, did you make for the fact that people in that high-rise building were working from home due to COVID at that point in time in terms of assumptions about the number of cars leaving there to go to work during the drop-off and pickup times for the school? So we followed CDOT guidance by comparing our traffic volume to um, pre-pandemic data that was collected by the Illinois Department of Transportation in 2019. And, and you're telling me the Illinois Department of Transportation, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Please finish. Um, I, I said we adjusted up uh, based on Illinois Department of Transportation figures collected in 2019. And the Illinois Department of Transportation collected information regarding the number of cars entering and leaving the garage and the Hemingway House apartment building. Is that what we're supposed to believe? No. So best practice going forward with um, this type of scenario would be to essentially um, leave the trips coming out of the condo building as they are because it's it's going to be difficult to tell how many people will continue to work from home versus how many people, you know, might be leaving the garage in the future. Um, but, you know, e even if we were to um, bump that number up to the same amount of people that were leaving pre pandemic, it would not have an impact. Um, it would not have, the, it would have a very small impact on, on our analysis. So first you said it would have no impact. Then you said I'm it would sorry, have I a really spoke. small analysis impact. But frankly, you don't know either way because you don't know how many cars would be coming or going from the Hemingway House apartment building um, in the morning in a non-COVID time period, right? Mr. No, Chairman, but... I'm sorry, can I, I, just let me know when I can interject because this is, this is a, you know, I know we're not in a court of law, but this is kind of a. I think you can interject on the basis of what Council Blonder saying, like an objection of some sort. Well, well of, course, of course we object, but I, I, one question I have for Council is what's the relevance? Our loading is on Lincoln. We did that specifically. So we would avoid issues on Clark. So our, our witnesses testified that the number of cars will not have an impact on levels of service. And so, and, and, and I'm not hearing at least an objection that somehow we're gonna be blocking cars from coming out of the driveway. So I'm just curious what, 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 what the council is getting at. I think you'll hear some testimony, including from Mr. Taxman, that the analysis that was undertaken was inaccurate and is flawed and will result in cars both circling and coming back in front of the Hemingway house ingress and egress. So the car count is directly relevant. Okay, and so I, you know, um, Councilor Blonder, and then I agree with this process, we don't have it really in relevance yet. Um, but it sounds yep. like it, it might be depending on the testimony. Um, yep. So, you know, um, I'll let you keep questioning on. Um, okay. I just have one or two more questions. Sure, and then it'll be helpful, you know, to keep this part quicker yep. and then get your trap sure. shot. I just have one or two questions, which okay. is the 30% adjustment you made for the AM and the 20% adjustment for the PM. Where did you get those figures from? Um, I believe I already stated that, but those were from comparing our volumes to the Illinois Department of Transportation 2019 historical data. Okay, and you don't know what, again, we, we don't know till we're out of the COVID era, whether that number is right, wrong, too high, too low, correct? 
Um, I don't believe a historical tra traffic number can be right, wrong, or correct. We're following the Chicago Department of Transportation guidelines of comparing volumes uh, collected during the pandemic to historical volumes to adjust up to, um, I guess, you know, their data is based on segments of roadway. So they say, you know, go to the nearest segment of roadway that's close to your site, evaluate what those volumes were in 2019 and adjust your volumes up to those. And the IDOT numbers that you were using for that adjustment were for which of the four streets surrounding this location? Um, IDOT has count on, they had count on Clark Avenue and Lincoln Avenue. Clark and Lincoln at which intersection? Um, I believe the segment counts were further north. I believe the Lincoln Avenue counts were uh, north near Dickens. And I think the Clark ones were up near Webster. But again, at the time, this is, you know, that is what the Chicago Department of Transportation recommends to do for traffic studies conducted during the pandemic. They say find the closest segment. So that's what we did. And you did no analysis as to whether south of Armitage Avenue and north of Armitage Avenue, where the segments that you used were, you made no comparison of the density of the neighborhood, the number of cars, the type of facilities that are there in doing your analysis, correct? So generally the segments are, you know, when they're doing these tube counts, they're, they're for quite a, you know, a good amount of, of space. So if they're doing a segment count on Clark um, and, the, and the tube is placed near Webster, they're generally going to be collecting data and then saying, you know, this is for Clark between, say, Armitage and a street that might be north of that, such as Fullerton. Right. And my point is you did no analysis of the differences between Armitage and Fullerton and between Armitage and Lincoln, correct? Well, they, they only have one segment count in that area. Right. So in other words, there wasn't a segment count that covered the area south of Armitage and the four streets around where this facility is proposed to be located, right? That would be correct, but only because CDOT um, does not recommend that you would have to conduct segment counts for every single traffic study you're doing um, that would take everybody much too long to complete these. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, I have no further questions of this witness. Okay, thank you, Councilman. Um, so with that, um, I think we should move into um, the objectors traffic study. I understand that there's a traffic engineer here. Is that Mr. Taxman? Yes, it is. Okay, great. Um, then if it sounds right to you, I'll get Mr. Taxman sworn in and he can present. That'd be great, Your Honor. Mr. Taxman, will you please state your name and address? Yes, uh, my name is uh, David Taxman. Um, I'm at 3230 West Commercial Boulevard, 3300 in uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? I do. Okay, great. Um, then go right ahead. Thank you. Mr. Taxman, if you could please explain briefly your background. Um, I'm a uh, traffic engineer by uh, education. I've been working for more than 15 years. Um, I used to live in, I grew up in Skokie and used to work out at Chicago. And I've done a lot of traffic studies in the Chicagoland area. Um, okay. But now, yeah. And what were, who retained you and what were you asked to do? Um, so I was retained by um, the Hemingway House as part of an assessment to try and understand the impact from the development of a school at that corner of Clark and Lincoln and really assess if, if this is going to be problematic from a safety and traffic condition standpoint um, to try and just get a fair uh, opinion about about the, the traffic study that was conducted and review it and see if uh, it was done in, in its full capacity and understanding traffic in that area. And how did you go about undertaking your work? What steps did you do? So yeah, we did a review of the uh, February 12th, 2021 study and uh, we wanted to concentrate on, I think three main things, um, looking at the COVID factor, 
looking at the parking analysis and looking at the operation of the uh, loading and unloading area. Um, as Mr. Blonder was discussing the COVID factor and how it was uh, um, determined, it was based on a comparison of IDOC counts to intersection counts that were done around the site. Um, what we did is we actually did 24 hour hourly counts uh, where the IDOC counts were performed to develop um, another COVID factor essentially to really see how does actually, how was traffic impacted during COVID um, at that exact point where the IDOC counts were done, which is on Clark Street, north of Webster and Lincoln Avenue, um, north of uh, West Dickens Avenue. And so we looked at both the 24 hour counts. We saw on Clark Street, there was a difference of 144% and on Lincoln Avenue it was a difference of 23%. Um, and that's for the over a 24 hour period. During the AM peak hour, we saw a, a reduction of 64% on Clark Street and a reduction of 51% on Lincoln. And then during the PM peak hour, we saw a reduction of 178% and a, uh, an increase actually of 5% during the PM peak hour on Lincoln Avenue. Um, so so Mr. Jackman, I don't mean to interrupt you, but that's a far yeah. cry from the 30% and 20% that was we just heard about, correct? Correct, yeah. I mean, it's there's been, based on this analysis, there's substantial impact on Clark Street um, and, and during the AM, it's showing substantially greater impact on Lincoln Avenue. And humor so. me for a second, you didn't use statistics. You guys actually stood there and count, counted cars? Yeah, so we did set out road tubes and did 24 hour counts um, on a weekday and uh, in April, late April and uh, compared it to the IDOT counts from uh, 2018. Okay. Um, so I didn't mean to kind of detract you. Please continue. So the other thing we wanted to look at was the parking availability analysis that was done. Um, and it's, we didn't redo any counts. We took the counts from the traffic study just to kind of look at them a little more closely and try and understand what they mean. And they did a very good job of doing a, a study of uh, traffic availability or parking availability, sorry within a 12 block area of, of the site. Um, the one issue with the parking availability analysis is that it, it concludes that there's a lot of available parking in the area. However, the, really the only available parking in the area is pay parking on Clark Street. Um, there is, during the AM and PM peak hour, there was only one space available or three spaces available of free unrestricted parking. So that would include not permitted areas, not loading zone areas. So our conclusion was that it, it'd be very, most parents will be deterred from parking on Clark Street, taking their ch child out of the vehicle and then having to pay for parking and do this both in the morning and the evening for drop off and pick up. So they'd be deterred from actually using Clark Street for parking and instead rely on the uh, loading area. Um, so in general, there's really no available free parking um, in the area. And when you start to displace parking, the free unrestricted parking, which is located on that east side of Lincoln Avenue, those cars are gonna have to go somewhere else. So they're gonna be looking for other places to park. So there'll be less available parking in the future. So, um, so that was one thing we looked at. And then the next thing we really looked at was really the operation of the drop-off pickup activity and trying to understand if the number of spaces being provided for that is going to be sufficient. Um, so we actually did counts at Elcott or Alcott Elementary and uh, College Prep East Campus School, which is a little more than a mile from the subject site. And uh, we looked at the AM and PM peak drop-off activity to understand um, how many vehicles, the number of vehicles that are using this. We just looked at Orchard Street. So actually, I, I just want to back up a quick. So that school uses three streets around it for drop-off pickup activity. It's a school of 589 students. 
and they have about 43 on-street loading spaces. And during our observations, we saw even some queuing on Orchard Street, up to 11 cars just queued on the street, blocking traffic. And this is during COVID, mind you. Uh, I can't imagine what that operation looks like when it's in full operation. We don't know exactly how many students were in the school at the time, um, but it's probably not 589. And this is a school that makes up uh, a range from pre-kindergarten to up to 12th grade. So it's not as many kids that are gonna require that type of care and handholding as a, a daycare would. Um, so based on our study of looking at the AMMP and peak hour, we found that the, uh, the average drop-off time in the morning was about uh, one minute or 1.61 uh, minutes. And then in the evening, the average uh, pickup time uh, was pretty extensive at about a little more than eight minutes um, on average to uh, pick up a student. Um, Again, this is based on actual observations, not hypothetical statistics or generalized studies, correct? Can I chime in just on, on that? Because on the actual statistics, I'm wondering what the exact method was in getting those statistics. Um, David, was it you out there clicking or who, who was doing the counting? It was not me. Um, we use a data collection firm as do pretty much all traffic engineering companies. Um, and we use it, we were using a national company um, known as Quality Counts. And uh, they were stationed out there. They tend to set up cameras at times or they just have somebody sitting out there that's actually um, observing the vehicles um, and then looking at how long it takes for the vehicle to, so they use cameras in this situation. And then they, they look back at the cameras to then assess how long it took for uh, the vehicles to um, either pick a student up or drop a student off. And so we took that data and we got rid of any buses because there was one bus and we got rid of any um, delivery vehicles. So we were really just concentrating on parents um, dealing with the drop off and pick up. And so, um, so we looked at, yeah, that operation and we compared it to the, uh, the proposed school, which plans to have 200 students. And we used the trip generation that was um, calculated from the traffic study, from the initial traffic study, which, you know, to put in perspective is projecting about 100 students or 100 trips during the AM and PM peak hour. So that's saying that half of the parents are not dropping their children off during the peak hour. Um, so based on that analysis, you know, looking at the queuing activity, if you're having 10 spaces on, uh, on the east side of Lincoln, we're projecting about a 580 foot queue. And this is conservative. I mean, this is like with those, with those, uh, those numbers, because again, those, that average drop-off pickup time during the evening is based on a school that has pre-kindergarten K through 12. I'm guessing it would be a lot longer if you're dealing with um, students uh, with, with an all day care facility and how long it takes to drop off and pick up the students. Um, and they had a pretty good operation at Alcott. I will say they had, a, it was pretty organized. Um, in terms of what they were trying to do. But in that regard, we found that about a 580 foot queue is projected and it, it would stand well past Lincoln and Clark. And so there would probably be a, a row of vehicles looking for parking on Clark Street um, and potentially blocking driveways and such. So looking for anywhere to pull over so they could drop their kids off. And that would include the ingress and egress to the garage to the Hemingway Condo Association, correct? Potentially, potentially. Okay. Um, anything else that you want to highlight in terms of the study that you did? Um, no, I think that's pretty much it. Okay. And we've submitted the entire study that you did. Um, if we went through it, would your testimony be consistent with everything in that study? Correct. 
Mr. Chairman, I have no further questions at this point. Great, um, and thank you, Mr. Taxman. So now we'll go to um, Councilor Borski and he can ask questions of uh, Mr. Taxman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so uh, David, thank you uh, for your testimony. And uh, so that your, your report really focused on the three areas, right? Which is the overall traffic volumes and the issue of whether COVID you know, impacted that. You looked at parking in the area and you looked at the queuing operation, right? I just wanna, so Correct. those, okay. So I'm, I'm gonna keep my questions to those three areas because you, you're not, I just want, you're not, you didn't question our, our statistics and our numbers relative to like the number of trips that we thought would come to the school, correct? Our, our hundred number, you, you, you took that as being accurate, correct? Um, took it as being accurate, not necessarily. I mean, it's, it's one of those things, um, as was described previously, that it's based on national statistics. Um, each site is unique in its own respect. Um, and again, we, it, it would be interesting to see doing a, a, a trip gen study of a daycare school in Chicago that kind of meets some of the same, you know, traits okay. as the, the proposed post site. But okay. yeah. but, so, and, but, you, and you, but you, didn't, you didn't do that, right? So it's interesting, but you, 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 the numbers that we have relative to the trips coming to this location you're, you're going to live with those, my understanding. Right. Okay. All right. So let, let, let's turn first to the, um, the, the issue of, of the COVID numbers uh, or, and the increase, right, the, the supposed increase in the amount of traffic because we didn't factor in properly relative to COVID. Um, first of all, I, I guess my, my main question there is, we're not gonna necessarily agree that your numbers are accurate, all right? But if we do accept that there's an increase, a uh, higher volume of traffic on Clark, right? Because really what, what you found was there was very little difference on Lincoln. Um, but even if you found it on Clark, um, did, did your analysis include how that would impact the level of service in the area? It didn't really what we wanted to shed light on is that the methodology is somewhat flawed, that there is a potential for much greater traffic and it's hard to really know how much COVID has impacted. So the best method obviously is either to use turning movement intersection counts that were conducted pre-COVID or wait till things return to normal to actually accurately analyze the intersection. So. Um, it's hard to know how the intersections really will operate in the future with the projected traffic if you don't know the existing conditions um, within a good amount of accuracy. But you, you took statistical analysis, you came up with what you thought would be the volume of traffic based on your counts. Did you then, I mean, the essence of our traffic report is that the levels of service based on this school being here will not be impacted. Levels of service, right? Which I know it's a term you're very familiar with. Did your report analyze levels of service? It did not, no. It did not. Okay, so you don't know what it means if there's 133% or a million and 33% you don't know what impact that has on levels of service, if I'm understanding. Your report does not analyze the, the foundation and the most one of the most important things of the traffic study, right? Correct, but if the numbers are wrong, then the traffic study level of service might not be accurate as well. But it, we acknowledge it may not be, but, but you don't know what that level of service is. There's a, there's a range of levels of service, correct? goes from like F to A, correct? Correct, so typically anything worse than D, E and F is considered unacceptable. Um, but the, the, the purpose of our analysis wasn't to determine the level of service. It was to determine if 
the level of service from the, the study is accurate based on using the existing and future counts. And so based on this analysis, we're saying that there needs to be further study in terms of understanding future traffic conditions um, and in applying maybe a more appropriate COVID factor. So, uh, let me ask you this then, just based on your experience, yeah. Let's take Lincoln, Lincoln Avenue, for example, which you said had some difference, but not a huge amount. If we have a level service of B on Lincoln Avenue currently, what would you expect the level of service to be based on your traffic counts? Honestly, I, it's very hard to answer. Are you talking about like Lincoln and Clark? Or are you just talking about Lincoln Street? Like what? Well, we, we looked at intersections and, and Justin, you can chime in, right? That's where you, you measure the levels of service. It's not just, it's just not just cars flowing up and down the street, right? It's when they come to an intersection, how long it takes to get through the intersection, how long it takes to make a turn. Did you look at any of that? We did not calculate level of service. No, we just looked at the uh, COVID factor. Okay. All right. So you don't know whether this school is going to have a negative impact on level of service or not. I just want to make that clear. Let me, let's talk about the parking. Um, yeah. Max, you, you looked at parking um, in the area and you acknowledge that there is a lot of parking, although you conclude that most of the parking that would really be available to parents, if they had to park, by the way, right? We'll, we'll get to the issue of whether they need to park or not. But if they do, um, you, your contention is that they're only limited to, to paid parking. Is that right? Essentially? Correct. Okay. And, and did you count the amount of paid parking in the area? So we didn't actually conduct parking counts. We relied on the parking counts from the traffic study. We just looked at them a little more closely in terms of how much parking is available um, that can be used by parents who are dropping their kids off or picking their, their kids up from the school. And really the only available parking was the parking on Clark Street. Okay, well, again, let, 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 my first question is, let's just assume everything you're saying is true. Yeah. Is there insufficient parking, paid parking, on Clark to accommodate what you believe might be overflow and people needing to park? I think there is probably sufficient parking on Clark Street if every if all if the parents were to park there based on the the queuing hours because what we determined is that the queue would be about 26 vehicles, I think it was, during the PM peak hour. Um, but I don't think that parents would want to have to keep paying they wouldn't default to my point is is they would default to going to the loading because that's free as opposed to trying to park on clark street and risk getting a ticket or having to pay for parking every time well and you weren't here at the last hearing but the alderman <laughs> the alderman said they're very fierce about uh having traffic cops out there and enforcing uh you know people to obey the parking laws and so I guess my question is, you know, on what basis can you say with certainty that people will not use the paid parking? With what certainty? I can't say 100% certain that they're not going to pay for parking every time they drop off or pick up their, their son or daughter from the school. But I can say that people are driven by convenience and cost. And that if something is more expensive, they are going to be deterred from making that option. So they would go towards the free option, which would be the loading area. Well, well that, that might be the case if there weren't a traffic person out there perhaps giving them tickets because they're outside of the loading area, right? So, I mean, if you're talking about a cost analysis, which again, you know, maybe the most incentive is for them to pay a dollar or $2, which is what it would cost to park for, for 10 minutes. If again, if that's what they needed to do in the parking, wouldn't it be a lot less expensive to do that than to get a oh. ticket? Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't understand your question. I didn't understand that there was gonna be people actually ticket, that they're, they're saying, yeah. I thought they were gonna be ticketing on, on Clark Street. 
you're saying they would ticket people that were blocking the traffic. I well, again, the, the alderman said that they would have police out there if it became an untenable kind of situation, which again, we, we, we firmly believe that it will not, but that's what, that's what she said. So I'm just basing it on the alderman of the ward, what, how she likes to enforce things here. So I, let me just cut to the chase. So you, you don't know, number one, whether people would or not use Clark, but there is adequate parking on Clark if it became necessary. That's correct. What you, okay, all right. So, let, and let me get to the, uh, the issue of, of parking elsewhere in the neighborhood. So again, this just goes to your contention that maybe people would wanna use, look for free parking, right? You, you've contended that there, there is not adequate additional free parking in the area. And so I guess my question is, you know, you, the condo association and you by extension are contending that we did not factor in COVID, right? When we did our parking counts, did you factor in COVID that perhaps these are currently under, in our current uh, 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 situation that we're under in COVID, that when COVID lifts, maybe some of these people won't be parking on the street anymore and maybe there will be additional free parking in the area. Did you factor your COVID, you know, your COVID contention into when you looked at that? That is a nearly almost impossible to actually factor in because my guess would be that pre-COVID, post-COVID, most of the free parking in that area is going to be 100%, close to 100% occupied. Um, yeah. But we would have you, to look you, at old counts. What do you base that on? Living in Chicago for years. <laughs> well, you live but, in Florida now, but. You know, but and, yes, and, no, I, I, right. I understand your point. But it, I, you know, if you go through the, the parking counts, it's very limited free parking within that 12 block area. Most of the parking is either uh, permit parking or pay parking. Um, well, so there's okay, very limited our, spaces. Our study said that if people had to park, there would be adequate parking for them. Whether it's free or paid, there would be adequate parking. Do you disagree with that? Again, I think there is available paid parking in the area, whether it's pre-COVID, post-COVID, whatever, that will be available um, to support parents picking up and dropping off on Clark Street. Okay. All right. But you don't, you don't know with any kind of certainty whether there might be more free parking to, to back up your contention that somehow people would be forced to use the paid parking. I, uh, can, I, can I point something about, about, the, about the permit parking? Um, so the permit parking in this area, um, along with a lot of the permit parking in Chicago, actually becomes free parking during the day. Um, the permits are required there to park overnight. So in this specific area, Lincoln Park West, Wisconsin, um, and I believe the, the little street north of Lincoln in Wisconsin are actually, their permit from 6 p.m. at night to, uh, to I believe, midnight. Um, so then after that, you know, during the day, this parking would be free to anyone. Um, you know, while I, while I do agree that it's... The, the potential is there that when people start to go back to work and start to drive to work, some of these spaces could open up for, for parents that are looking to pick up or drop off. Okay, well, thanks, Justin, that's helpful. It's just more, more, more evidence that um, there's a, a high likelihood that your study is accurate and that people, if they had to, could find a parking spot in this area, um, free even. So let me just turn now to the last issue, which is the analysis. Of Sorry, could I, could I break in here real quick on the parking? No, um, Ms. Wright, you're going to get, I have it in my notes, you're going to get your turn because we haven't Got heard it. testimony yet, but right okay. now we're committing it to this conversation, but don't worry, I'll call you. Okay, thank you. So I just want to turn to the last issue of the, the loading operation, and you... You, you based your analysis on the loading of Alcott Elementary School and a high school. And your contention is actually that those schools would maybe have fewer drivers, right? Because 
perhaps there's older people, older kids going, so, so you wouldn't necessarily need to have more drivers. And therefore, that perhaps there would be more drivers coming to our school. But yet, you didn't, you don't, you don't dispute that we've got 100 drivers based on our initial traffic study. So, so I think we can just totally look at the comparison of the, the queuing time, right, which is an essential aspect of your analysis and your conclusions. And so I, my first question is, did you look at any pre-Ks so this is queuing time frame? This and that Alcott Elementary School includes pre-K. It, it does have some, but did you look at a school that is a pre-K only? We did not, no. You did not. So you don't really know then how the pre-Ks in Chicago necessarily operate as opposed to a, a, an elementary school and a high school. Is that, is that fair to say? You have no basis to say, they're going to operate in a similar way. Well, our, our idea was to include a school that was within the area. That's a neighborhood school. That's a Chicago public school that includes pre-kindergarten. So, I, and I understand, and, but did you, did you look at any pre-Ks in the area? No, we did not look at a school that was exclusively pre-K. Okay. So, so again, you're, it's apples to oranges, theoretically, right? I mean, you, you don't know how a pre-K operates. Let me, let me ask you this. Do you think that when you have older kids that there might be things that they're doing after school which require more time? Maybe, maybe a parent needs to come and visit a teacher. Maybe a kid has some kind of after school activity. Could you see a situation where it might be that you need longer times to pick up at a school where there's older kids, as opposed to a pre-K where at the end of the day, the kids go home and they don't do anything else. Is that possible? Um, it's possible. Okay. But I we did notice that at the school, they had a special area for the pre-K where they had to deal with those kids. We did notice there was a special designated area for that, that they were, but they were all mixed in. It was, it, they tried to create it, but it was like, it was like a blend, but okay, but again, that, that's something just, we observed. And I appreciate that. And I, because it's just more evidence that you're, you looked at an apple and we have an orange. Um, they're just totally different. I think we, in, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, I, I mean, we, we've put in testimony at the prior hearing and at this hearing that pre-Ks have a, a very distinct way of operating. They're very different from our other, other schools that we operate. And the pre-Ks have a very short window for pickup and drop off. And, and by the way, I will also just note that, that um, David's study only said there was an issue with afternoon pickup. In, there's no problem with morning pickup. So, we're only talking about in the afternoon, and then we're talking about whether his study really reflects how this school is going to operate. And we, 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 he does not know whether the pickup time for a pre-K would be different from that what it would be at an elementary school and a high school. And the, you know, we've already testified that it's a three-minute turnaround time typically for pickup and drop-off. These kids are walked out of the school by, by a staff member, they get loaded in the car and they go. There, there, there's, no, there's no need for, for lots of you know, other kinds of interaction at these, these types of schools. So again, I, I, you know, I, I don't think frankly, and you know, we can have Justin make the, make the actual statement, if, but I don't believe that yeah, this. I think we've got enough on. Yeah. That. Okay. I I don't think there's anything here that disputes our findings. Let sure. me just end with that. Okay. Yep. Okay. So is that the end to your questioning? Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. So first, um, I want to, and actually, board members should and do feel free to ask questions the whole time. Um, but before we go to um, opposition and support that isn't on the testimony yet, um, I want to offer up to the board members to ask any questions.
Okay, great. So let's move um, now to um, the only objector we have signed up that hasn't given testimony. Um, and that is Miss Pamela Reich. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, Reich or Reich? Um, you, you did good. <laughs> and all day I mess up names. Um, anyway, will you please state your name and address? Pamela Reich, um, 1850 North Clark, Chicago, Illinois, 60614. Thank you. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes. Great. Okay. What brings you here today? Okay. I'm a resident here. And from what I actually understood, you say that the parking, excuse me, the playground is not part of your jurisdiction to consider, right? That's correct. Okay. So that puts away part of it here. Mm -hmm. um, you, I have, so I have a couple of things here with the parking. We're talking, uh, all of the conversation has been about the parking for parents, not the parking for the residents and what this will do, taking away those parking spaces, what that will do to the residents. And in uh, the traffic study, they had the occupancy rate at, I think it was like 69.8%, but they included with that the paid, which was 14%, which brought everything down. If you look at the free and permit parking, which is what matters to everyone in the neighborhood, if you, the combined free and per, uh, permit parking, and what I did is I just used GHA's raw numbers. Everything is from there. Um, and I, I know I forgot to include my spreadsheet on Monday, but I did send it the other day. So you've got how I came up with these numbers. But the average occupancy rate, if you combine it, is 92%. You eliminate those 10 spaces in front of Lincoln, that occupancy rate goes up to 95%. You eliminate the four spaces on Wisconsin, it goes up to 97%. And then we have to think about staff members because if there, there's 10 spaces in Hemingway House, but there's 18 other staff members, and if a third drive to work, you gotta assume they're not gonna look for, for paid parking. They're gonna try and go for the free parking and that early in the morning, they should have a shot at getting it. Um, so with that going on, with the 10 spaces in Lincoln, that brings the occupancy rate up to 98% with Wisconsin and it's 100%. And that is with GHA's numbers. So for residents, the parking is an issue. And if you look across from Hemingway, that's pretty much all, all row houses. And if you go west, it's row houses without parking. Parking is critical to the area. And I noticed you say that only about 30% go uh, drive to work. That's how much 70% need that parking because there's not parking there. They don't have garages. 70% need that parking. You take away 10 spots, you take away 14 spots. And that's kind of a big deal. In fact, because even uh, case 232-21Z, what did they say? They said that they couldn't rent because they didn't have parking. That's how important the parking is to us in this area. Um, and also contractors from, uh, you, you know us, our contractors are eight to four. They depend on the free parking. If they don't have it, it's gonna get passed on to us. Um, also just as a little thing, with all the, the queuing in that, contractors back in and back out. So that's gonna hold up traffic a little bit more. So um, any questions for me on the parking? Nope. No, it, but, um, but, but if you can feel free though to ask any questions. It's your time now to ask any questions. Oh, okay. Um, of the, um, of, of either, either, either parking expert, sorry. Trap okay, trap. <laughs> so I guess then of GHA, did you consider what taking away these parking spots are gonna do to the area residents? us living there. And that this considered? would be a question so for Council I think, or, okay, whoever. Either one. Okay. Was that, okay. hello? So I think the All consideration right. would be that if we, if we were going to be doing parking counts, um, for that type of reason, we would expand our parking count area because, um, you know, generally it would be considered acceptable to, to park it, you know, a decently far distance away from your house and, 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 you know, having to walk there if, 
if you're a renter, you, you know, this area, um, that that's pretty standard. Um, we also would have expanded our parking to count on Stockton Drive to see if there would be um, anything available there. Um, but again, did you, you know, we did we did count um, in October of 2020 when when presumably you know a high percentage of people were working from home um, and a lot of businesses were closed. So going forward here. Uh, you know, we do see some, we're going to project that there will be a little bit more parking availability in this area when people start to drive to work. But you said that only 30% drive to work. And if, did you go back and look due west and northwest and southwest? Because 99.9% .9 of all of those houses back there, no garages, even right across from us on the, the, the uh, Google Maps, I think I counted, I don't know, 16, 20 row houses and each row house has, you know, several apartments to it. They all depend on that. And if you did go around to the around in the neighborhoods, you will see that there's there's less parking there than there is on Lincoln and Wisconsin and Wells. It's even more crowded because that's there's no commercial there at all. It's all packed together parking. So I think if, if did, you, did you look at any of that, any of the, the further parking around? No, but I do believe if we did look at it, we would be able to find 10 spaces. Um, it's also worth noting out that uh, this area is very well served by transit. Um, you have three bus lines on Clark and you're also, I believe, um, close enough to a train to here that you can walk. But that has nothing to do with people's parking patterns. They're not going to, they're either, either going to take transportation, CTA, or they're going to park. And like I said, if they're taking CTA, that means that their cars need that parking space on the, on the street during the day, all day and night. Parking availability can have a big impact on somebody's mode choice and on Wait. where they live. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I didn't hear you. I said the parking availability can have an impact on somebody's mode choice. The car is going to, but they're, I doubt as it's in, going as to, in as people, as people that live people here, I don't think not. that they're going to get rid of their cars just be, you know, because of, because of this. They have cars because they want cars or they don't. No, but what we're seeing more and more as we um, move forward in the future here is less and less people are actually owning vehicles. So you, so you think that in this area, there's going to be a huge difference in the next two, three years that's going to open up spaces? Um, uh, no, I wouldn't say in the next okay. two to three years, but I do believe, um, you know, in, in the immediate area, if we would have expanded our count locations, uh, we would be able to come up with the number of spaces that we were displacing. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm living here and, and looking around, I'm going to have to disagree, plus finding a spot here and a spot there and a spot here and a spot there, it's, it's, not, it's not the same thing. And, and so it's going, no matter what, it's gonna have a very immediate impact on the parking for the residents. And I think that's been overlooked. And I think that's important. Um, I think it's also important to point out that that parking, um, you know, it is free on the east side of England, on Lincoln, but it's not guaranteed that the people parking there are actually residents. That could be, you know, that could be parking that would be utilized by people visiting businesses as well. Right, but that's it's, it, that's still part of it today. And like I said, there's also contractors and there'll be six more, at least six more staff that are gonna look to use that. And then our, also, like I said, our contractors will lose it. And whoever is using it now for business purposes is gonna still be using it in October for business purposes. That's not gonna go away. The business purposes would be able to be absorbed by the open parking on Clark. Um, and then, you know, as I said before, if we expanded our, our parking count reach, we would be able to find the uh, 10 spaces we're displacing. I think there, there if you didn't look at it, he said, you know, if, if you go, if you go looking one space on, you know, one block, five blocks away, one here, one there, you know, it's and it's day to day, but we're beating a dead horse here. <laughs> so um, with the traffic congestion, I want to make sure I understand correctly. 
you're, you're suggesting there's going to be 100 students driven in cars and then 100 are going to walk? Is that what you're projecting? Or did I misunderstand that? That is correct. It would be about, that's a projection that about 100 people, 100 students would be dropped off via vehicle and 100 would be um, getting to the school in some other way. Well, okay, so I think can we agree that since they're four-year-olds, they're not going to walk more than three to four blocks. If they've got a stroller, it'll be by six to eight, whatever. They're not going to be riding bikes. But let's just say, okay, you've got 100 kids coming. For every student, there's a parent. There's, so that's 200 people. You're also going to have some strollers, the occasional baby carriage. All of this is going to be converging on also the 100 cars on a very a small sidewalk and small area there. And most of them will come from due west. I mean, it's the park and the zoo across on the east. So it'll be coming from, you know, west, northwest, southwest, all coming in the back here at the same time as 100 cars crossing the streets at intersections, you know, needing the same space as, as the, the staff are, are using to get shut all the kids from the cars to inside. You're going to have 200 people with 100 parents trying to get their kid in there also. Has that been considered by anybody? The impact? Uh, yes, that? that was considered. And, and also, um, we, we didn't factor in for any carpool as well to ensure that, to ensure that conservative analysis here scenario. But the sidewalks in this area um, are, are a good size. You know, they're, they're standard sidewalks uh, within the city of Chicago. And actually, the ones on, on the east side of Lincoln and the west side of Clark um, immediately adjacent to the school are actually much larger than your normal sidewalks. Um, you do have that little plaza area there to the east as well. Um, but that, that is all factored into our analysis. You know, we input the crosswalks, uh, we input the pedestrians. It's also important to note that we did also increase um, the pedestrian and bike volumes just as much as we increased the traffic volumes just to ensure we're... Um, did I miss again, it on the on the traffic report, I didn't see where you talked about uh, the impact of of people walking. Did I miss that? Uh, yes, that is actually built into the intersection capacity analysis. So, so in our in our software, we input the number of people crossing the intersection as well as the number of bikes that are traveling through the intersection. Um, so, okay. So, how many? Out of curiosity, how many? How many did you add at the intersections for the 100 students walking? Um, so those, those students wouldn't be actually crossing any crosswalk. They would just be getting out of the car taken by the staff and immediately. No, the, uh, one, I'm, the ones that are walking. How many, how, many, how many students and parents you said that you put into the intersections? How many did you, did you figure? Um, we, you know, we increase the pedestrians by a factor of 30% in the morning and 20% in the afternoon, but it is worth pointing out that um, pedestrians do have a lesser impact on the traffic operations than, than a vehicle does. Because, you know, when you have a walk signal, whether you have five people crossing the walk signal or, you know, 50 people crossing the walk signal, it's, it's, it's generally the same impact on the traffic operations in the area. So the, the 20 to 30 percent you're saying would be about the equivalent of 200 of 100 students and 100 parents. And so was it was it part of you part of yours to take a look at those how what it's going to do to the sidewalks in the back there on Lincoln to have all these people come in at once? Was um, that, they, was that, was they, that they not your area? I'll be coming in at once when when you would have this window for drop off in the morning, you know, it's probably a 30 to 45 minute window. So um, you know, we wouldn't expect that it would have an inverse impact on, you know, people trying to normally traverse the sidewalk. Okay, so you're going to have a, a 30 to 40 minute window. Okay. Um, so I'm not a traffic engineer, but just from a logic as I'm, as I'm looking at this, and I'm not going to beat this, like I said, I'm not traffic engineer, but if you're talking about 100 uh, cars coming around, they all have to come down Clark Street, come that little part on Lincoln, which is only three cars, and go into the queue. Do I understand that right? Yes, yeah, so over a period of time, um, you know, if, if they're coming south on Lincoln, presumably they would be 
um, turning on Wisconsin Street, and you know they can't, they can't they can't drop off on the west side of Lincoln. Right. Okay. So because there's only on on that little on the little part of Lincoln between Clark and between Clark and Lincoln where it changes, that's that's only three cars. So is there going to be and maybe you've considered this? Is there going to be an issue if you've got people coming around Clark, and then they have that light so they've only got three cars and it goes directly into that queue directly from that light and then you've got wells coming up and it goes directly into that queue so you've got these two things feeding directly into that queue um did you look at if there's going to be any congestion or backup from that yeah so based on the queue analysis you know you know we in the afternoon ours ours was showing that there's potentially going to be a projected queue of 11 cars. So, so the 10 cars would be contained in there. And then also there's going to be the four staging spaces on Wisconsin and CPS is going to have staff out there communicating um, on, on when to move the cars from the staging area into the loading area to ensure that that backup does not happen. Okay, so you're, okay, just so I understand. So you're saying that 11, only 11 cars will be here to pick up their students, the, their children no, at once. That 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 would be our projected maximum at, at one period in time. You so know, there's there there would be, as we were talking about before, a hundred cars right. coming over the course of the entire you know drop off window in the afternoon, which you know could be thirty minutes, could be forty five minutes, uh -huh. um, but at, at the maximum projected queue at one period in time would be eleven vehicles. Okay, so there's like 10 periods then, nine periods or something to pick for 100 vehicles to go there. Is that right? Um, I, I, don't know, I don't know exactly what it would be off the top of my head, but it's, it's a decent amount, yeah. Okay, and, and the one last thing here did with, with the traffic, if you, if you look at that map, you've got 11 cars in that queue, and then they have to go out into one lane of traffic, right? And mm -hmm. another half a block up, they hit another light. And then that, that light is no turn on red too. Is there was there any looking at, at what kind of congestion that might might create on Lincoln when you've got eleven cars continually trying to get into one lane, a half a block up, they're hitting a light and a light with no turn on red. Yeah, drop off and pick up um, vehicles are factored into the analysis. Okay, for the congestions for them getting for them getting out and getting into traffic. So, you know, not just that they're in traffic, but getting, you know, stopping the cars, having to weave into the, the traffic that's already going down Lincoln. Um, so, we, so we don't specifically, you know, model as if they're pulling off and pulling in. What basically we do is assign them to the network. So in general, that queue will, will not back up to, to impact um, that drop off or pickup area. Okay, but you, you, but you okay, but you didn't factor in the, the problem of them trying to merge into, into one lane when you're and when you're at the intersection at the same time they're merging into one lane. You got the people from Wells coming right up, right up behind them, and then the pe people on Lincoln going right up behind them, and then half a block later you got you have a traffic light. And well, so that well, you you're you're from your analysis just that, that just so that you countered all that all that in and it's not gonna create a problem. Yeah, so what we do is we actually input them as um, in, in the synchro, you know, software, we input them as parking movements. Um, and, what, and what the software does is it's able to, you know, assign a little bit more delay, the more parking movements you have, because mm -hmm. it's okay. going to account for the car pulling back out into the travel lane with the cars that are already traveling in that traveled way. Okay, okay. Um, like I said, you're not... You know, the, the playground, which is, so the noise is not an, uh, not an issue. Got the parking and just with the, with the property, you know, the property value. And I realize there's bigger picture that you don't consider with the property value. You only look at one piece. And if that one piece has an impact on the property value as opposed to all the pieces, is that right? I, I, got oh, I, I didn't actually look at property values. I believe somebody else was responsible. Yeah, uh, actually, I, I was actually, Mr. Mr. I was actually asking Mr. Knudsen is when you, when you, when you look at this, 
there's you know different pieces that impact the property value. But do you just look at the are you just looking at the one traffic piece as to whether or not that impacts? I just want to understand how it works. This stretch um, today is really focused on on traffic right. because our last meeting was everything. So our standards are pretty clear, and and it, of course people can say they're they're a little bit general, but the standards that go into approving a special use. I'll touch on each of these issues. There's not one okay, thing does. that cancels something out. There's not one thing that makes something up for sure. It's viewed okay. by the board. Okay. Yep. Um, and and the, the other thing with, with safety, I know there's been a lot of discussion that during school hours, there'll be um, you know safety protocols in place, but outside of school hours, has anyone looked at that? Because you're going to have kids coming from the neighborhood. They're going to be coming from the park. They're coming come from, coming from the zoo. And in fact, on the IDOT crash map, uh, crash map, map coming across Clark, there, those are exactly where the kids are going to be. You know, hey, mommy, I want to go go play on the playground. Where they're going to be running across, or you have teens that late at night that are going to use it and run across. So it, it actually kind of ma matches up with the crash map. Crash map, excuse me. Has anyone looked at the, the issue of safety outside of school hours? Sorry, I was Sorry. Um, um, the crash yeah. data is collected, uh, you know, from mm -hmm. from a period of 2014 to 2018 during all hours of the day. Right. Um, so, you know, what we found in analyzing that is that, you know, unfortunately, nobody, you know, in a perfect world, we would have zero crashes. Right, yeah. Um, but these intersections are, are not atypical for the city of Chicago. Uh -huh. um, and, and, you know, there was nothing irregular in the data that, that pointed us um, in the direction that, you know, this is an unsafe area. Okay, so you don't anticipate any safety issues with kids running across the street and everything after school hours where there's no safety protocol in place for them? Well, they do have the crosswalks um, at each intersection with, with marked crossing. Yeah, they're, they're, they're kids. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I, I'm sorry. Can I just interject one thing here? Um, again, I, I appreciate Ms. Wright's uh, concerns, but after school hours is after school and these kids are four-year-olds and they are, <laughs> they're not there after school. They get dropped off. They're in the school, they get picked up, mm -hmm. and then that's it for the day for them. So it's not like there's this is not a high school, it's not an elementary school where kids are running around. These are highly supervised and you know, contain it's a contained situation. Mm -hmm. So and and that that was something that we looked at and and we did discuss at the last hearing too. Right. But so I thought that my understanding was that the playground was going to be open outside of ours. That it was not that the playground was not going to be strictly during school hours for the the, the preschoolers. It was going to be opened up. <laughs> the playground is not an issue at the hearing. So. So so it will be opened after hours outside of school hours. I, I don't know, but it's not a matter for this hearing. We we we. I think the the person that I mean I, I don't know, but. Again, it's not relevant because it's not a matter of any of the factors for this for this hearing. Okay. But it actually, Scott, it actually is because yeah. it impacts on the safety and the traffic study to the extent there's going to be kids going into and out of the streets or on the sidewalks. Well, we can, you know what, if CPS feels that there's creating some kind of safety issue, then they will act accordingly. So if the, if the playground is somehow contributing to more traffic accidents because they're letting their kids run around unsupervised, then they'll shut it down. I mean, I, I don't know what else to tell you. I don't think I don't think anybody's uh, you know looking to try to create an unsafe situation. Well, no, of course not. It's the opposite. I think everybody's extra concerned, deeply concerned because of the, the, the additional children that are, that are going to be both during the day and then, you know, the, the preschoolers and then outside of ours. And I'll say, I'll say too, and, and Ms. Reich, I think um, because, you know, 
the playground is in the site plan. That's what we're going off on. I know there's a separate separate right. thing the playground, but we're for the special use. It is in the site plan. So I do think in a way um, it's a fair argument that it ties to, it's relevant to safety. Um, so I just want to throw that out there. It doesn't mean we need to go way down that route because I do think the right. board has a pretty good view on all of this, but I, I mm -hmm. don't. Want to you. Okay, thank you. Um, one thing I, I want to circle back real quick during bad while you're while we're get while you're projecting 100 cars in good weather in bad weather when it's raining when it's snowing did you look at how how high up that's gonna change those hundred cars during bad weather I'm sorry I'm sorry I can't sorry, I was there we I go was that's okay sorry. uh no we did not consider that is it, I think it's, is it, is it fair to say that in bad weather, when it's raining, when it's snowing, when it's really cold, that yes, yeah, some will be carpooling, but you're still going to have, you know, everybody's going to be driving in one, in one fashion or another. So it's going to go considerably beyond the hundred cars. I would not say considerably. It might go up a little bit. Yes. If you have a hundred students that normally walk, that's not going to, 100 students aren't going to turn into 20 extra cars, are they? Uh, we would not expect that many, no. Well, I'm sorry. So you're saying that 100 kids, 100 kids that walk, they're, they're not going to add 20 cars to the queue? I'm sorry. I, I must be confused. Can you, can you restart at the beginning okay, of that if question? There's, I'm sorry. OK, if there's bad, during the bad weather, those 100 mm -hmm. kids that normally walk, did you consider that those they're not going to be walking, they're going to be driving? And so you've uh, got a, some of them may drive. So when it's raining or snowing and that you don't think that they'll you 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 think they'll still walk, four-year-olds? Uh, with their parents, yes. When it's raining and when it's raining and it's snowing and it's really cold, you think they're gonna still walk to school? Yes, they do. Okay, okay then. Um, oh, did anybody, has anybody looked at air, air quality, what the emissions are going to do with the extra cars? You got a hundred cars twice well, a day. As soon as these cars exist already, I, you know, like, so I don't know, I, you can carry on with this, this is fine. No idea. I'm just asking. Has anyone talked about? Has, has that been looked at? Does anyone think that's an issue or not? No, I don't think anyone's brought it up as an issue. Does um, anyone think it would be an issue? We wouldn't expect it to be an issue because generally, if if somebody's um, a decent amount of these people who are going to be dropping off their kids are likely driving to work after. Um, so you know, while their trip might divert slightly to drop off their kid. Um, we wouldn't expect that it would increase air emissions that much. Um, you know, if we were going to be concerned about this site for air emissions, there are, there are far greater developments in the city that generate far, far more traffic than this um, that we should be more concerned about. Okay, so, so the 100 cars that are, are essentially going around and then idling, that shouldn't be an issue with air, air emissions? Air emissions? I, I don't know, I'm asking. No, not with how long they would be there. Okay. I'll just note that as part of the, in front of Alcott Elementary School, the signage that designates the loading area also includes uh, wording that uh, diesel engine vehicles should not be idling, um, which does impact the air quality and especially when you have young children in the area. So it is an issue at that time. I, it appears it has been an issue in the past, that they've had to include that in their signage, so. Especially because it's concentrated. It's not like it's coming up from a couple blocks queue. It's concentrated and it's literally going around our building, coming from Clark. I mean, they've got to get into queue in the back. So it's literally going to be these cars coming around our building and then idling, so in a, in a confined space. Can I, can I, inter let me ask Evan Smith from CPS a couple questions based on some of the testimony that was just put in here. Evan, are you there? Yes, I am. Evan, we got to get you sworn in. Um, can yep. you your name and address? 
Uh, Evan Smith, um, 8423 South Jeffrey, Chicago, Illinois, 60617. That's my home address, actually. Okay, thank you. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes. <laughs> okay, so let, Evan, just let me ask you two questions. One is, first, I'm going to go back a little bit to the the testimony about the playground. And again, I know it's not a it's not a an issue per se in the hearing, but the concept of kids getting out and and escaping and running into the streets it, it, is the playground supposed to be open or closed after school hours. Um, I don't believe that it has been determined at this time, but as you stated that CPS will, if, if that becomes an issue, the CPS will act accordingly. Um, there are some instances where playgrounds um, are available to the public after hours. However, there are also some playgrounds where they are restricted to the school. The final determination at this location has not been made at this point. Okay, and then um, as it relates to uh, signage and idling cars, if similar to Alcott, for example, if if we CPS feels that there is an air emissions issue because of diesel cars, would CPS be willing to put up signage or at least ask CDOT, whoever you know installs the signage, to have the same kind of signage indicating that. Please do not idle your car if you're driving a diesel engine. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And I have a I have a quick comment. Presumably, um, my guess is those were placed at Alcott because I I believe Mr. Um, or David alluded to this early. They they do have a couple buses over there. Um, this school at 1840 will have no buses. Okay. So yeah, this this right. So I think you know if there's um, this has gone on for a while, and I think a lot of it is yeah. good, good background. Um, so I would just say you know if there's anything else that you really want to get out there. No, um, the, the I'm sorry. The only other thing was just, and I know this is just traffic, but it's still part of the big picture of property value. And when you put it all together, you've got the noise, you've got the parking, the congestion. Um, when you put all of that together to consider the impact it will have in property value and if people are going to actually want to move here when they, you know, with all of those things put together and, um, you know, and that, you know, people with small children, if they do, that, that really shortens our, you know, our pool, plus the fact that they don't have to live here in the area to go here and it's, you know, it's one year pre preschool. No one's going to move here specifically to go to that preschool if they really want it. Like I said, it's not, they don't have to be in the school district. So, um, you know, I think property value, uh, I hope you will consider that and consider, like I said in my written testimony, if you were in here, if you were thinking, if, if you, you know, your home was in here, if you were looking at investing six figures in here, and there are six other high rises around here. In fact, two on the lakes, just like us on, on either side of us. Is this where you would come? Or would this, or would this have, would this, you know, have you go look at the other places around here when we talk about property value? Yep. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, thank you. This, um, this was, this was, good additional background and I think we did a good job of keeping it to new issues so thank you um, very much for all the planning that went into it. I do now want to go to the new um, support. Um, there's someone on, on the support side that signed in and did have testimony from our last month meeting. Um, so Steve Pierce, are you on? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. Can you please state your name and address? Yeah, it's Steve Pierce, uh, 1850 North Clark Street. I, I live in the Hemingway House building. Okay, uh, great. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? I do. Okay, go um, right ahead. Thank, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, good afternoon. Uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> this is taking so long. I'll try to keep mine brief. Um, like you said, I, I was not able to make the last one. So um, I apologize. This doesn't really have anything to do with traffic. Um, but uh, as, um, 
someone who's hoping to start a family in the near future, uh, I was pretty excited to learn about the, the addition of the preschool in a now vacant space that has been vacant for a couple of years now. Um, and I was a little bit surprised when our condo association hired a lawyer to contest the issue, um, especially because there was no polling done of the building. We have close to 300 units of the building. I would have expected some, some polling before doing something like that. But um, all that aside, um, the, uh, the property value argument is one that I feel most able to, to speak to. Um, I don't know much about traffic. I'm not a traffic engineer. Um, I don't, don't drive a car. So I, <laughs> I think that's a pretty common thing with, with people in their younger people now. Anyway, anyway, getting back to my point, um, we, as just putting the economist hat on for a second, the data all show appreciative impacts from um, schools. I, I've never heard of any school bringing down the value of housing. However, vacant space, there's a mountain of data for this. Vacant space does cause property values to decline. And I, I just was baffled uh, at, at the assertion that anything would happen to negatively from having something a school that is the most family friendly amenity there that exists go in a space that was previously vacant. Um, the uh, the noise issue, I also would like to like that there are people going around here all the time. Like we live right across the street from Lincoln Park in the Lincoln Park Zoo. Um, I live on the eighth floor, so I'm not that high up uh, of 30 and um, I have never had any issues with noise. Even after uh, sporting events, we have a bar like half a block from here. Um, there are two other preschools within a block, private ones that are smaller, but like preschools nonetheless. I, I don't think there's been any issue with, with any traffic for those. Um, in fact, I, I see people waiting outside the, uh, like walking their, their children to that preschool. So I, there, people do walk their four-year-olds. Um, obviously, in terms of traffic, we do have many buses uh, servicing our area. Like you can walk outside and 10 feet to the left of the entrance of the building, there's a, there's a bus stop. Um, and Clark is a four lane street, like it's pretty big. Um, we have had traffic before, we're next to the zoo. Uh, Stockton always has parking if you need parking. Um, and uh, I, like I said, I'm gonna try to keep it brief. So that's, that's all I really have to say. Um, just emphasizing the point that it's, it's completely preposterous to assert that uh, property values would decline from putting a school in a vacant space. Um, anyway. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the time. I hope everyone has an excellent weekend. And um, I'm glad this this lengthy meeting is hopefully coming to a close in the near future. Great. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate appreciate everyone for coming in today and also for making it to the end of our meeting. I do um, want to um, uh, open questions from the board. Um, any additional questions from the board or else I want to get the alarm statement. I have a sense the board feels we have more information on this than <laughs> any we've seen in quite a while. Um, so Alderwoman Smith, um, if you are on the line. I am. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> I've been oh, listening. Yes, good. I, I know you have. There's just a long list. Um, so I, I'm going to get you sworn in just to do so. Can, can you please state your name and title? Michelle Smith, Alderman of the 43rd Ward. Thank you. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes. Great. All right. Go right ahead. Well, uh, you know, it, it's tr it's uh, traditional for the alderman to state her position at the close of a case. And of course, this case is um, somewhat unusual and somewhat difficult because it, it, uh, it, it involves something that's very important to our community, which is education. 
and residents who are very concerned about the impact of that facility on their on their location. So uh, that being the case, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I, I'm just I'm going to stay neutral in this in this particular uh, in this particular dispute with the neighbors. And I know that there's a lot of information in front of the commission, but I'd be happy if you have any questions for me. I'm happy to answer them. Great. Yep. Thank you so much. Thanks for for coming and also waiting uh, all day. And that goes to everyone on this call. Um, so it sounds like there's no additional questions um, from the board. I want to. Think I have a question for the alderman. I do have a question for the alderman. Um, two questions, matter of fact. Alderman, do Who you think it's, does this fit into the character of the neighborhood? Sorry, and sorry, does, Sam, Sam, uh, sorry I, don't think, I don't think the alderman heard you. So when you say oh, I'm sorry. This is Commissioner Toya, alderman. Hi, Commissioner. Hi, hi, Commissioner. I can't see everybody for some reason. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Sorry. I, I, I sorry. Uh -huh. I asked two questions. Do you think this fits into the character of the neighborhood, number one? And mm -hmm. number two, do you think uh, the neighborhood needs a another school in the 43rd Ward in this part of the city? Well, CPS has identified that. CPS has said the reason that we're here. Yeah, but no one knows CPS their ward. Said. You know this ward back yeah. really well. So I, I want to hear your expertise. Yeah. Well, oh, I guess what I what I do know is that preschools have been a growth industry in our ward uh, since, and children have been. In other words, children, and, and uh, this is the only part of Chicago in which enrollment in CPS schools has grown, that is until, you know, the pandemic. So we don't know what the long-term thing is gonna be, but the answer is yes, it has grown dramatically. All of, all of our neighborhood schools have grown dramatically, even in the time, in the 10 years since I've been alderman. And uh, it, it seems as though I can't speak to whether or not uh, people are gonna enroll in a CPS preschool, but enrollment at our preschools is all filled. We had six preschools when I started as alderman in the 60614 zip code. There are 24 now. Right. And, you answered that first question. Thank you. And do you think this, again, mm -hmm. I'm not, I know you're neutral on this. I'm just saying yeah. the character of the neighborhood, you, again, you know this intersection very well. Um, yeah. Does it fit into the character of the neighborhood? I, I can't really dispute. I really can't say that it doesn't. There's a preschool up the okay. street in the 1900 block and preschools all over the place. I, I can't, I can't say that it's not in character. Hey. Thank you, Alderman, for being uh, giving me those facts. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Toya. Mr. Knutson, could I say two very quick things? Um, One, sorry, who's, who's speaking? I'm sorry, this is Pamela. Right. Actually, I, I have something to say too. I, I know Ms. Reich has had a lot of airtime here. Yeah. Um, no, and we're I know only... I spoke last time, but I am the president of the Condo Association. So, I, okay, I would, so, yeah, so, so Mr. Marcus, first of all, if you're not sworn in, so let me oh. hold on a second. I'm oh. only going to hear from, we're only going to hear from one other person, and it's got to be brand new because we don't do, we, there's no filibuster here. Sometimes more is not better. Um, so I, I will let um, Ms. Marcus speak um, because she is president. It sounds like she has something new. But at this point, it sounds like we have a lot from everyone. So it's got to be new or else um, we're, we're going to end it. So, so with that, will you state your name and address? Sure. Uh, Athena Farmakis. I live at 1850 North Clark Street, um, Chicago 60614. Um, I, I, I just feel swear, like... Do you swear oh, affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes, I do. Great. Go right ahead. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, as far as something being new, I think something really hasn't, it's, it's, it kind of comes up in this conversation and in this testimony, but maybe CPS could reiterate, because um, we're hearing a lot of unknowns, like will rain and snow affect it, or um, is the COVID factor correct? But the one thing that I can say that we all heard at the community meeting, where over a hundred people attended, where CPS, the one thing that wasn't unknown, but was very clear, was that Lincoln Park residents were not gonna have priority for attending their children at the school. 
And I feel like that really hasn't been flushed out or answered by anybody at CPS. Number one, why? I mean, we're, this is in the 43rd Ward. We have an alderman who, here. I, I can't say why she won't um, be specific and be neutral, but perhaps it's because our ward is not getting priority. So I think, I, I think that's really important to our residents to combat what Steve said, who does, does live in our building. Um, the board members had an overwhelming response from our residents and owners. Um, and I, I can pretty much say that it is in stark contrast to what, you know, the only person that was in support here today who was Stieg, um, you know, unfortunately, he was just recently voted off the board. So that I think is really indicative of where our building stands on this. Our building is very strong about this issue. Our building stands in strong opposition for, for a number of reasons that I'm not going to repeat, but with all due respect to the ZBA's authority, which you, which you do have in issuing a permit here today, I, I don't understand why the, um, the tenor has changed now where you're not even gonna look at or um, assess our easement rights. I, I don't, I think that should be- so, 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 And I can repeat that because that was hashed out at the last meeting. Um, easements, this is a private contractual issue. If you want to address the easement issue, that's not with us. And also I would say it's not in our purview to know even that who's getting priority at the school. That's a community issue. When it comes down to it, the ZBA, we're really lo only looking at the five standards for a special use. So right, I, understand, but, but, I understand that the easement might be at an issue. It's just not with us. Right, but so many things that have been testified to today, the 50% factor where a hundred students are gonna be walking to school, that's, that's we're taking that as fact, whereas when we're told that uh, Lincoln Park's not going to get priority, all of a sudden we're taking these unknown fabricated numbers and then putting them to some kind of truth. When no, no one from CPS has even testified or talked about why Lincoln Park's not going to get priority at this school and how that will substantially affect the numbers that they are providing for us. I, I just, yeah, and, and we, we keep Michael, dancing around that issue. And, and to be fair, it, it could be, it's a very fair point. It's just not a point for ZBA, right? Like that's a community issue. That's something to bring up on the meetings outside of us. We just give the special use license. Like, you know, it, it, I don't even, it wasn't anywhere in the application that it's not Lincoln Park priority because we don't weigh that in our standards in any way. But that's, you're weighing, but you're weighing the traffic study and all of the findings. That's in our standards. Are I, working in that premise. All of the findings are working on the premise that 50% of kids will be walking to the school. And how, that's all I'm saying is how can you make that an axiomatic principle and a premise when when it's a faulty premise because we've heard the one known thing that Lincoln Park residents will not get priority to go there, which is gonna increase the amount of cars. I, I I just feel like we keep dancing around that issue. And that's what's really important to our residents and our owners who maybe like Steeg is looking to start a family and bring a four-year-old to that school, but they're not gonna have priority. We keep ignoring that, um, but telling us that we have to deal with the traffic, we have to deal with the congestion, we have to deal with the fact that we don't have three streets to queue the cars like Elcott School does, but we basically have one or two streets. Um, I, I just think we're ignoring a big premise here that uh, Lincoln Park is not going to have priority. And a lot of numbers are being thrown at us with no real bases. I can just speak as president that our building is in strong opposition to this. I, I know you've heard that and I'm just going to repeat May it. May I interject? Um, I don't think that there that anything will be added. This isn't a this isn't a, a meeting of, of the HOA in any way. That's fair. Um, so I I and I hear everything you're saying, Mr. Marcus, because I think we do have a lot of information on both sides to discuss. And when it comes down to it, you know, our our factors that we weigh they're public, um, and that's what we'll be we'll be voting on. Um, there's certain things that I've tried to shut down throughout this that simply we can't do because of our, our jurisdiction on viewing this issue. Um, but luckily the conversation hasn't focused on those things because we've shut that down. 
um, traffic alone is one of our standards, you know? So the, the focus of the call today and the back and forth has been really productive. And now we've got to go back and, um, and just discuss everything we've heard. No, I, I understand, but I just wanted to, you know, make a final, sure. final statement on behalf of our residents and owners who have been, who have been very um, involved in this process and the board of directors has listened to them and um, we, we sent over 150 or close to 170 signatures that we accumulated in, in a short five day period to the aldermen. So I, I think our, our stance is very um, well known and, 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 and I hope it's really taken into consideration. We're not against the school. Of course, anyone would love a school in their community, but we would like priority and we would like it in an area where it's not gonna increase congestion. And given that CPS has the burden here. Um, we don't really think they've met it through their study or through any questions or um, through anything that they've propounded to this um, board. But thank you. Yep. Um, no. uh, yeah. Chairman, let me just jump in real quick. Um, just as the so chairman fun. said, this we're, we're, this is Commissioner Toya. Um, we're, you know, we're here to look at zoning issues. And I just want to clarify one thing. You said you wrote 150 letters to the alderman's office. That's great. But remember, the alderman does have no voting right on this board. Uh, we listen to her just like we listen to you, just so you know that. I just want to make that perfectly clear. The alderman oh. has, we listen to her testimony just like we listen to everyone else's testimony. Uh, but she does not vote on this board. So I just oh, want no. to be we, clear on that. No, we're very clear on that. But you know, everybody answers to somebody, right? We answer to our residents and, and, and owners, and I know... We, we, we go to our alderman because we know she answers and she represents us. So that's why we went to her. Not, not that she would have a vote on this board. We just wanted, we know she has a, a say and we know that she has a voice of some sort. So that's why we went to her. And we heard her say she was neutral. So we heard that. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think this has actually all been, uh, we've got a lot of information here and I say that in a positive way because um, everyone did a lot of homework here and these issues can obviously be really tricky. Um, so with that, I, I think I, I've heard no additional questions from the board. So I think we've got far more than enough here to go back and take it into consideration under our standards. Um, so again, I really do wanna thank everyone for your time last month, this month, in between. I know a lot of time has been spent and we're gonna take this all under consideration. Thank you, we appreciate it, all the hard work. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, can I ask a question, please? Uh, I don't know who's speaking, but we're sure. closed it down. Um, we, just, uh, we just closed it down. I just want to under is Harold Dempo, one of the attorneys for Hemingway House. When will hey, we Mr. hear? Dempo, I'm, I'm sorry, we're, we're done. No, I just want to understand when we'll hear from you. Okay, so, um, so at all of our meetings, we vote now, we go deliberate, and you'll hear at the end of the night. Okay. Yep. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. I thought you were opening up a line of questioning again. <laughs> uh, no. But, no. I know when to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> um, okay. Great. So we are done. We're now going to go, um, one second, everyone, sorry. Okay. I move that we convene in the closed session pursuant to section 2C4 of the Open Meetings Act for the purpose of considering the evidence and testimony presented in open session. For those viewing by live stream, we will then return from our closed session and the live stream will continue at that point. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. Okay, I vote yes, we're closed and we'll be back.
Hey, Colin, uh, can you promote Sam? Thank you, Chairman. Of course. I had my hand raised. Usually it's pretty good when I have my hand raised. So. Uh, okay. Uh, I move that we return We return to open session. Commissioner Tobias Seconds. Commissioner Saul. Yes. Commissioner Sanchez. Yes. Commissioner Esposito. Yes. Commissioner Toya. Commissioner Toya, sorry. Yeah. Okay, great. I vote yes. We are back. Um, we will now vote. Yeah. Nope. Yes. Yeah. You can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Great. We will now vote. Note that any motion to approve a special use will be tied to the recommendations of the department and any additional conditions that could be read by me. Okay. I move to approve application for calendar number 187-21-S. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes. The matter is approved. I move to approve application for calendar number 188-21-S. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito. Yes. Commissioner Toya. Yes. I vote yes. The matter is approved. I move to approve application for calendar number 189-21-S. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul. Yes. Commissioner Sanchez. Yes. Commissioner Esposito. Yes. Commissioner Toya. Yes. Okay, I vote yes, the matter's approved. I move to approve application for calendar number 190-21-S. Commissioner Troy seconds. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Troy? Hey, Commissioner Troy, there's some lag. Um, yes, I don't yeah. know if you heard me. No, okay, great. So uh, let me try some out. Yeah, there's a, let me take, let me do something different here. Shoot. All right. Hmm. All right, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I don't know, something's wrong, you're right. Okay. All right, we'll, leave it that way. We'll, yeah, we'll make it work. Um, I move to approve application for calendar number 191-21-E, dash Z, sorry. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes, the matter's approved. I move to approve application for calendar number 192-21-Z. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes, the matter is approved. I move to approve application for calendar number 193-21-Z. Commissioner Toya second. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes, the matter is approved. I move to approve application for calendar number 194-21-Z. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes, the matter's approved. I move to approve applications for calendar numbers 195-21-Z and 196-21-Z. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul? Sorry, yes. Oh, no. Um, Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. Okay. I vote yes. The matter is approved. 
I move to approve applications for calendar numbers 197-21-Z and 198-21-Z. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Stahl? No. Commissioner Sanchez? No. Commissioner Esposito? No. Commissioner Toya? No. I vote no, the matter is denied. I move to approve application for calendar number 199-21-S. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes, the matter is approved. I move to approve application for calendar number 201-21-S. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes, the matter is approved. I move to approve application for calendar number 204-21-S. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes, the matter is approved. I move to approve application for calendar number 206-21-S. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes, the matter is approved. I move to approve applications for calendar numbers 207-21-Z and 208-21-Z. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes, the matters are approved. I move to approve applications for calendar numbers 209-21-S and 210-21-Z. Commissioner Toy seconds. Commissioner Stahl? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes, the matters are approved. I move to approve application for calendar number 211-21-Z. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes, the matter is approved. I move to approve applications for calendar numbers 212-21-Z and 213-21-Z. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes, the matter is approved. I move to approve application for calendar number 214-21-Z. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes, the matter is approved. I move to approve application for calendar number 215-21-Z. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes, the matter is approved. I move to approve application for calendar number 216-21-Z. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes, the matter is approved. I move to approve application for calendar number 217-21-C. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes, the matter is approved. I move to approve application for calendar number 218-21-Z. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes, the matter is approved. I move to approve application for calendar number 220-21-Z. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes, the matter is approved. I move to approve applications for calendar numbers 223-21-Z and 224-21-Z. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? <clears throat> yes. I vote yes, the matters are approved. I move to approve application for calendar number 226-21-Z. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. 
I move yes, the matter is approved. I move to approve applications for calendar numbers 227-21-Z, 228-21-Z, 229-21-Z, and 230-21-Z. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes. The matters are approved. I move to approve application for calendar number 231-21-S. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes. The matter is approved. I move to approve application for calendar number 232-21-Z. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes. The matter is approved. I move to approve application for calendar number 420-20-S. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes. The matter is approved. I move to approve application for calendar number 135-21-S. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes. The matter is approved. I move to approve the written resolution containing findings of fact consistent with the votes of the board for calendar for board calendar numbers 106-21-Z, 121-21-S, and 45-21-S. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes. They're approved. I move to approve the written resolution containing findings of fact consistent with the votes of the board for the board's March 19th, 2021 regular meeting with the exception of board calendar numbers 130-21-S, 60-21-Z, 80-21-S, 107-21-S, 120-21-S, 109-21-S, and 110-21-Z. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes. They're approved. I move that we adjourn this meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner Saul? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes, we're approved. Um, thank you as always everyone. And I wanna give a thanks um, this meeting, especially to everyone who works a ton in the background. Um, Victor, Janine, Jeanette, Kamal, Kamal, Francis, Marcus, Katie, Donna, there's a ton of people. So thank you so much um, because you guys make this happen. See you all next time. Thanks.